Hello guys, good morning. I just need to check my audio. Test, 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 test. Louder. Test. Nice. See you in a bit.
Guys, get slowly ready. We start in, uh, I don't know, one or two minutes. I get a quick coffee. So guys, hello and good morning. Let me check if my Zoom is unmuted properly. Can you all hear me? Nice, super, thanks guys. I need to click this away and we're in business. Super, hello guys, wonderful good morning. Couple of uh, small things first. Number one, I mean, I've already uh, posted an announcement and I sent it into the group, but Officially, so it's not a mistake, we really have officially two lectures back to back. So officially it's really scheduled for four hours. Uh, I don't want that you think that I uh, requested this. Obviously I would never request something like this. The alternative was the second lecture, Friday 7 to 9 in the evening. So I thought, yeah, well, that's equally shitty. Uh, and I also thought, well, we can make the best of it. So on the agenda today, one real lecture, so roughly, well, what the length of our normal lectures, so I would say roughly two hours, maybe a bit faster. Uh, secondly, uh, I want to do a recap of everything we have discussed so far, including our refresher session. And what I want to emphasize is not the individual concepts. I get the sense that you understand this well enough. So if I ask you certain definitions, you typically can deliver really well. So I want to focus specifically on the connections between the concepts. I get very often the sense uh, logically, that it is rather difficult in finance not to understand one concept, but how it relates to everything else. So the idea would be that after today's recap session, mind map session, that you basically don't have uh, a, a ton of different in individual concepts floating around in your head, but that you're really able to link them to each other. That also has the advantage that you will remember stuff that you put that you put into perspective to each other much much better and last but not least obviously uh we are not here only to chat about you know corporate finance at the end of our course unfortunately there will be an exam for you so i've cooked up a couple of questions i think it's five or six questions uh that uh cover a little bit of everything what we have discussed I think one or two are rather easy, one or two a little bit more challenging, uh, and a little bit of average, just that you get a bit of an idea um, what to basically expect. But full disclosure, initially I wanted to do Menti, but that's then really only multiple choice, so I've created a, a separate PowerPoint presentation for that. It's still kind of multiple choice, but uh, it will allow you to basically in the chat write a little bit more. And the idea is that I give you a question, you do the best you can, whatever, in, in a minute, within a minute. Afterwards, we briefly talk about it. Why is something right? Why is something wrong? Uh, and move on. And uh, obviously, I'm not really sure how long everything will take us. I hope that we, we can wrap up in, in maybe something like three hours or three hours 15. As always, feel free. I mean, I will obviously keep in the back of my head that uh, we need breaks. Uh, but please don't be shy, especially in such a, such a weird setting like today. If you feel you need a break, there's nothing wrong with, you know, speaking up, let me know and we, we, we can immediately have a quick break, all right? My plan would be to have the lecture as normal with a break in between, after the lecture another break and the recap plus the questions I would like to do in one go. Does this seem acceptable? Does this seem like a meaningful plan to you? Nice. And before we hop in, as always, are there any questions, anything pressing, anything especially that is worrying you? All right, not yet. 
Well, let's see if I can change this. No, don't worry about it. Let's hop in. Let's hop in. On our agenda today, the topic limits to the use of debt. Let's, let's jump in. This is of course a bit of a recap. There's nothing uh, new here. We learned that in a world with perfect capital markets, so in brackets immediately think, aha, Modigliani Miller world, there are a couple of statements that we can logically derive. Well, not we, Modigliani and Miller derived it, but we can, you know, try to remember. So what is the case in the world with perfect capital markets? The value of a firm, the market value, you might want to make a brief side note here, distinguish between market value and book value. When you have an accounting session with me, we will exclusively talk about book values. In finance, in corporate finance, we are much more interested not what an accountant writes down based on accounting law, but more what happens in the reality, so market values. So this is something that you could read up on to deepen your understanding of the differences between accounting and finance, market value versus book value. So the, the market value of a firm would be independent of its capital structure. That means, this is just complicated finance language for, capital structure is irrelevant, it doesn't matter. And the reason for that is also quite obvious. Uh, we have diagnosed already in several different contexts that a shareholder can uh, artificially create whatever leverage, whatever capital structure he, she, they desire in the firm's capital structure that they are invested in. So logically, capital structure in a Modigliani Miller world, so in perfect capital markets, should not matter. Brief side note here, it also makes sense to look up when we in finance use the term perfect capital market, what does this really mean? So that's just a set of assumptions, no transaction costs, no taxes, all kinds of assumptions. Look it up, make yourself a, a, a couple of bullet points. What does it mean when somebody says perfect capital markets? Just that you have a couple, two, three, four bullet points in your head. What else can we diagnose in a world with perfect capital markets? Capital structure choice doesn't matter. And secondly, the overall cost, well, the overall cost of capital of a firm is not impacted at all by changes in leverage. When I say here overall cost of capital, that is just simple language now for WACC, the weighted average cost of capital, is not impacted. And then we said, okay, well, but this is so unrealistic, we need to drop assumptions. And the first assumption that we have dropped is that in the real world, companies don't have to pay taxes. So in a world with taxes, but otherwise still perfect capital markets, what happens then? Well, a firm actually is able now to increase its, again, market value, not book value, market value. But how? By taking on more debt in its capital structure. Brief side note here, don't forget there are a million different ways how we can express this thought. We could say by levering up, by stopping to be an all equity firm, by increasing its leverage, by increasing its debt to equity ratio. All of that means the same thing, which is the firm takes on more debt and has more debt in the capital structure. If you're struggling with terminology, really write this down as if you were studying whatever, German, English, French, whatever vocabulary. Okay, I really studied myself like that. And once I was able to realize, ah, that all means the same thing, my thinking got much, much clearer. So I really recommend this. What else can we diagnose in the world with taxes, but otherwise perfect capital markets? Now, yeah, the overall cost of capital of a firm actually goes down with leverage. That is something we will, we will recap in a neat way today again. And this is the same thought now expressed as a diagram. There's no need to worry about it. I, I'll walk you through it. Normally, when you see a diagram like this in finance, the x-axis is typically a timeline. But don't immediately assume this when you are confronted with a diagram. Really sort of read it like a sentence. What is going on? On this axis, we plot the debt to equity ratio. And on this axis, we plot firm value, market value. This here is the zero coordinate. So just, just so we're on the same page, I would like that you tell me where on this axis would an all equity firm be. Anybody, anybody feels brave enough? Where is a firm that is all equity? Unmute yourself and tell me. Shoot. I didn't hear it. When, when x equals zero? 
when x equals zero, um, that is, I, I, I think I know what you mean. Just tell me when I should stop and I will make a dot then. Stop. Yeah, nice. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That is debt to equity. So that's not complicated finance, blah, blah, for anything. It's a mathematical term, debt divided by equity. So when a firm is, is, has zero debt, this whole term becomes zero. So where would we find then an all equity firm? Well, an all equity firm is a firm that has zero debt. So it would be exactly here, all right? And the maximum debt to equity ratio, well, that would be somewhere here. And as you see, it doesn't matter if a firm is all equity or if it's highly leveled, firm value is a flat line. There are no changes in a world with perfect capital markets. One of the assumptions of perfect capital markets is there are no corporate taxes. Whoop. Let's move on and look at what happens in a world with perfect capital markets, but there are corporate taxes. The diagram structure is exactly the same. We have here the debt to equity ratio, meaning here we have an all equity firm and the more to the right you go, the more highly levered firms get. Here again, we plot firm value, very low firm value, very high firm value. And as we see, if a company increases the amount of debt in its capital structure, so if it levers up, firm value goes up. Brief side note or question, how far up would this go then? Tell me. Any ideas? And so 100% of the capital structure is debt? Ab absolutely correct. Very nice. Yeah. How can a firm maximize its firm value? Remember, that's the objective that we are trying to achieve. Well, simple enough, if I increase leverage and an increase in leverage means an increase in firm value, how can I maximize firm value? Well, by maximizing the amount of debt in my capital structure. What's the maximum amount of debt in my capital structure that I can have? Exactly like you said, 100%. All right, nice. Firms should be fully funded with debt. Again, I'm not making a recommendation for the real world. We are still in a Modigliani Miller world. We have only dropped the assumption of no taxes, okay? That is not the real world quite yet. We have already mentioned that uh, in our last session. In reality, there are no firms that are 100% debt financed. So we have to ask ourselves, why is that the case? The Modigliani Miller uh, propositions are very beautiful, they are very enlightening and they help us understand and approach capital structure. But we have to address the elephant in the room, which is that none of what Modigliani Miller says checks out in the real world. So why is this the case? Or to rephrase it slightly, what determines the observed leverage chosen by firms? That's just complicated language for what is really causing it that in the real world we see not only don't we, don't we see firms that are fully debt funded, they all have very different capital structures. So what are the causes of this? Maybe relevant for your bachelor thesis and certainly for your master thesis later on, um, when, we, when we say something like this, what are the determinants of something? We are looking, this is not finance related, this is just relevant for research. When we say what are the determinants of something else, in regression logic, we are looking then for the independent variables that have an impact on the dependent variable, all right? So I, for example, I'm, I'm currently working on a paper called Firm Death, the reasons why firms get terminated. And uh, we literally write in our introduction, we try to shed some light on the determinants of firm death. It's exactly the same language structure here, all right? So the question then arises, we observe very different leverages, very different capital structures in the real world. So we have to ask ourselves, is there a common optimal, lever, uh, uh, optimal leverage ratio? Or is this case specific? Meaning, is this unique for each firm? And I hope this is not a spoiler now. The answer is, yeah, it's case specific. And I can already do this just by thinking logically now. We observe firms in the, we don't observe in the real world firms that are completely 100% levered, so 100% debt. What we see is firms that have all kinds of different debt to equity mixes. So I can already rule out that there is one optimal leverage ratio. So very likely, spoiler alert, 
it will be some case-specific situation, meaning this is different for every firm. Okay, there are all kinds of different theories, models in corporate finance that help us or try to help us understand how the real world works now. All of this building up on Modigliani and Miller. Like I said in my, in my message, in my announcement, none of this is going to be difficult. The value that I think I can add or that I certainly will try to add to connect the, the pieces for you, all right? So it's very easy in this chapter to get lost in details, even though you understand every single concept, how does this relate to each other? So that is what I will focus on today. So the first and very important uh, theory I would like to introduce you to that really deals now with the real world is the so-called trade-off theory of debt. Like I already mentioned, it is based on Modigliani Miller. Without Modigliani Miller, we would not have arrived there. What, what, what's the trade-off theory about? Trade-off means, that's just normal language, it means you are looking at a certain choice and picking one option over the other gives you certain advantages, but also certain disadvantages. Like before the finance exam, you're invited to a super nice party. You think it's going to be a nice party. You, you really want to go there, but the trade-off would be if you go party hard, you will lose a couple of days of studying. Should you go, should you not go, right? So trade-off means in a way compromising. So what is the trade-off theory of capital structure about? It's super easy to, to, to explain. You will get it in a second. So the trade-off theory, first of all, tries to achieve a certain objective. It tries to tell us, it tries to describe how a firm should optimize its capital structure in a world with taxes and with bankruptcy or financial distress costs and with agency costs. So we have now gotten rid of all kinds of assumptions. So all of a sudden, this is very lifelike. This, as you can see, it gets messy now. Because we have to consider now taxes. We have to consider, wait a second, if a firm levers up like crazy, 100% debt finance, would the, the firm not be exposed to a high risk of bankruptcy? Oh yeah, we need to factor that in. And last but not least, agency costs. That is a notoriously challenging concept for students to understand. Not because it's difficult, I suspect it's usually not explained very well. So this is... I think where I will add value, I promise that. And if you feel I fail my promise, then call me out on it. I will, I will try that in a, in a slightly different way. So what is now the trade-off theory of debt? Well, according to the trade-off theory of debt, firms constantly balance the costs and benefits, the pros and cons, the advantages and disadvantages of debt financing, trying to come down on an optimum point that this optimum point that I'm talking about would be the amount of debt that the firm should have in its capital structure in order to maximize firm value. So it's not only anymore to say, yeah, okay, let's lever up like crazy because nice tech shield. No, it's now more complex. If you lever up, yeah, sure. In the first step, you can say firm value goes up because of the tech shield of debt. But there will be something else pressing firm value down. What is that? Well, the bankruptcy costs, or officially in finance they're called financial distress costs, and the agency costs. So what are the advantages? What's the advantage and disadvantages of debt financing? We have a huge advantage, which is tax shield. What are the disadvantages that you have to trade off then? Well, an increased risk of financial distress and Agency costs. I will elaborate more on agency costs and also a bit of financial distress. Let's talk about this. This is a very, very important slide. You might want to make an exclamation mark here because it provides a neat overview of what is the trade-off about. Like I said, a trade-off is, you're not wrong if you say a trade-off is a kind of compromise. You're weighing different options and see what's better. So here we have all the advantages of that, and here we have all the disadvantages of that. And I have deliberately put on the slides the terminology every corporate finance book uses. So this is complicated finance, blah, blah. I will try to explain it in human language, all right? Number one, what is a potential advantage of that? Well, nothing new here. Debt reduces the tax liability, meaning the actual tax payment. Why? 
because interest expenses are tax deductible. That means you deduct your interest expenses in the income statement before you calculate your eventual tax payment. So that means the higher your debt, the higher your interest expenses, the lower your profit before tax, which is the number that you use to calculate your eventual tax payment, and that results then in a lower actual tax payment. Yeah, so this is simply the advantage of the tax shield. The second benefit of that is reduction of discretionary spending. What does this mean? It reduces the agency cost of the free cash flow. Awesome. What does this mean in human language? Let me, let me translate. So reduction means, well, something is reduced, something is, is, is eliminated. What is discretionary spending? Imagine you are shareholders, imagine I'm the CEO of the firm of which you are the shareholders, of which you are the owners. I obviously will not, whenever I make a decision, give you a call, excuse me, may I do this, may I do that, eh, nay. The most decisions I can make easily by myself, that's why you made me the manager of the firm to begin with. So all decisions I can make without consulting the shareholder meeting are basically discretionary decisions, up to my discretion, up to my best estimate, my professional judgment, if you will. So what does this mean here? What does it mean to say it reduces the agency cost of free cash flow? Let's start with the free cash flow first. Imagine a firm that is working very well, that's very successful. Every year I, the manager, generate with our firm very, very nice earnings, very nice profits. But we don't pay them out as dividends. We leave them in the firm because you, shareholders, say, well, it's good if the, the money stays in the firm. So if there are interesting investment opportunity. I'm sorry, I need to let James in. He's scratching on the door. I'm sorry, guys. James, oh. Yeah, 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 come. You can turn. I'm sorry, guys. The cat doesn't like closed doors. Uh, free cash flow, sorry. A lot of profits, but we don't pay them out as a dividend. That means our basically retained earnings, and on the left side, probably our cash balance, go up, go up, go up, go up. Why am I saying this? This sounds... I'm making it sound like it's a bad thing. Yeah, it could be a bad thing, depending on who is the manager of the firm. Imagine, I mean, feel free to have a different opinion. For my example, I like to go with this. Imagine I'm a bit of a Trump-like character. So I'm all about basically, you know, my ego, my, my perceived manliness. Now, number one thing I as the CEO will decide is in my office, I need a huge painting, two meters by three meters, a naked oil painting of myself. Who will pay for my, my, my oil painting of me naked posing in the office? Take an educated guess. I will take it, of course, out of our cash balance, simply because there's so much cash there. And I book it as a, some sort of whatever, business expense, something. I can actually do that. I could argue, I need this, it's important for my prestige, Customers appreciate it when they come to my office, that they are greeted not only by me in person, they probably want to see a three meter tall naked painting of me. So I actually could pull this off legally. Would this increase firm value? No, definitely not. All right. So what does it mean reduction of discretionary spending? How is this an advantage? Let's go through the chain of causality here. If we are an all equity firm, I, the manager, the sort of Trump-like manager, could really be very wasteful in my discretionary spending. I could buy all kind of random crap that has nothing to do with our firm. Then, as we are levering up, as we increase the amount of debt in our capital structure, at the same time, the interest expenses will grow. So the amount of money we, the firm, has to pay every year to our bondholders or to the banks, whoever gave the loans to us, whoever gave the debt to us. So the higher the interest expenses, the lower the free cash flow in our firm is gonna be, and the less opportunity for me, the wasteful CEO, to waste company money on discretionary spending, like the oil painting. Does this make sense, guys? Is this clear? Sorry, could you repeat that, the last sentence? The last sentence? Uh, whew. What was the last sentence? Yeah, so, well, basically, the, hi the, higher, yeah, the higher the amount of debt that we have, 
as a logical consequence. Debt is typically interest bearing, meaning you don't get a loan and then you just pay it back. You pay it back, including interest expenses from your perspective. So the higher the leverage, meaning the more debt in your capital structure, the higher the interest expenses. And the higher the interest expenses, the lower the free cash flow available in our firm, which I, the wasteful CEO, would use to buy random crap. That's, the, the, yes, the, that's, that's basically the chain of causality. Make sense? Yes, thank you. Nice, okay. All right. And last but not least, we're still talking about advantages, benefits of debt. Banks monitor managers much more efficiently. Let me elaborate on that. Imagine we are an all equity firm. Imagine a company of the size of Apple or Netflix or Google or something like that, Tesla. And you are shareholders. Each of you has a share, possibly two, maybe five. How do you think you can effectively monitor what I, the CEO, what I'm actually doing? You cannot show up in the company headquarters and say, hey, Elon, just here to check the books and your general sanity. Nah, that's not possible. You as a shareholder have not that many different tools available. You can go to the shareholder meeting and complain there basically and ask official questions, but really I'm relatively unchecked. If however, we introduce debt in our capital structure, let's say by taking out bank loans, well, the bank is very different because the bank says, I'm not your shareholder, I'm not your owner. I'm your creditor. So first of all, you sign this brutal loan contract that gives me, the bank, all kinds of rights. So uh, if you want to know more about this, you might want to look up, for example, covenants, protective covenants. So the bank will force me, the CEO, for example, to report accurately every year our financial performance, balance sheet, income statement, cash flow statement, statement of changes in equity. So banks are specialized in loan financing, they are much better at that than you or me. I mean, if I were to ask you privately, I'm a little bit short and I mean, you are one of my nicest students and I hope I'm one of your nicest teachers. I'm a little bit short on cash because our cat is literally eating the hair from my head. Can you help me out with 500 euro? You might even say, yeah, sure, James is a sweet cat. Let's help that guy out. But I mean, would you even know how to write a watertight loan contract? I mean, I have a couple of ideas, but I'm sure if I do my best, it's still not watertight. Banks, I mean, this is a standard form for a bank, all right? So banks are much better at monitoring the management, me, uh, more accurately. Does this point make sense, guys? Okay, I'm not hearing anything. I'll take this then as a yes. So that are all the advantages that you as a firm or as a shareholder really get to enjoy as a firm levels up. But the whole thing is called trade-off. So that means with the good, something bad will come as well. So let's look at the disadvantages of that. Number one, cost of financial distress. I have a brief example here, which is so easy, I'm almost embarrassed to show you, but I will anyway. Uh, the, I mean, the logic is, I hope, already clear. The more debt you have in your capital structure, the higher your cost of financial distress, the higher also the risk of bankruptcy. There's maybe one small point where I can add a little bit of value. Why is debt more risky, debt financing more risky than equity financing? There's one, one thing I would like to stress about this. Let's say we're an all equity firm and the company is not doing well. Of course, there will be problems further down the road, but not immediately because you shareholders only get money from the firm or by extension from me, the manager, when we have profits. So when there are no profits, you cannot send me an invoice. You cannot really sue me. You can at some point in a shareholder meeting get rid of me and fire me, but I don't have an obligation to pay you annually anything. If there are no profits, you get nothing. The end. That is very different with debt financing. If you get a bank loan, you have an obligation to pay interest expenses to the very least annually. And if you don't pay them, the bank will take you to court, all right? So the, 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 the equity financing does not increase the risk of bankruptcy simply because shareholders are not legally uh, entitled to receive an annual dividend. If there are profits, they can have a vote on it and ask for it to be paid out. But if there are no profits, yeah, too bad, 
Okay? What else do we have? Agency costs. Agency costs such as, number one, underinvestment. Number two, incentive to focus on risky projects. Actually, there's a third one, paying out cash dividends. So this is the point where at the very beginning to, of, of today's class, I said, this is where I can add value. So if at this point you don't know exactly what is meant here, that's perfectly fine. We have not addressed this yet. We will zoom in on this, okay? For the time, just remember, when in the context of debt financing, we use the term agency costs, we have to be more accurate and have to see agency costs of debt financing. There are also agency costs of equity financing, but they are not of concern to us yet. Agency costs of debt, and whenever you and me talk about this, I will immediately say, then tell me, what are the agency costs of debt? One, two, three. And this is what I want to hear. Underinvestment, focus on risky projects, paying out a cash dividend. All of which I will elaborate on, okay? And last but not least, we are now not anymore in the Modigliani-Miller world. We are even, not even in the Modigliani-Miller world with taxes. We are now in the real world. And in the real world, there are not only corporate taxes, meaning taxes that a firm has to pay on its profit before tax. There are also personal taxes for you, the shareholders. So if I pay a dividend to you guys, it's not like you can say, awesome, 100 euro dividends, party on. That first the Minister of Finance will say, okay, pay me. So how do personal taxes factor into this whole tax landscape? So I'm saying here, interest income is maybe taxed at a higher rate than capital gains. I need to explain this. There are at least two terms here that I think are worthy of explanation and definition. Interest income and capital gains. Because the core of the statement is there could be a different uh, tax rate between interest income and capital gains. Let's briefly elaborate. You are not my shareholder, you're just a potentially interested party, potentially in interested in my firm, in our firm, in the firm that I'm running as a manager. And now you have to make the decision, how do you want to be involved with me or with the firm, not with me, with the firm. Should you give a loan to the firm, basically would you like to be a creditor, or should you buy the shares, the stocks of the firm? So would you like to be a shareholder? What would be in it for you in either of the cases? If you decide to become a creditor, meaning you extend a loan to me, you give me debt, basically, what's in it for you? Well, the moment you give a loan to me, I, the firm, represented by me, the manager, I have to pay interest expenses from my view. From your view, the same interest expenses is called what? Interest income. So the moment I pay you the interest rate that is agreed on, interest expense from my view, interest income for you, the Minister of Finance says, oh, how about that? Somebody got lucky and got interest income, the applicable tax rate is whatever, 40%, boom. And I paid you 100, 40%, the Minister of Finance rips off of it immediately. So that would be interest income. If, however, you decide to become a shareholder, What's, what's in it for you then? Well, I pay out in times of profits a dividend, but if, even if I don't pay out a dividend, then we would accumulate retained earnings because I keep making profits that go at the end of the year in the retained earnings. Profits, 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 retained earnings grow. So the whole equity block grows. And think back of, uh, about what we have discussed in the context of uh, fundamental stock values. Now, equity divided by number of shares outstanding gives me some sort of fundamental stock price. So that means the stock price would grow, 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 grow. And that is called capital gain. So if you bought a stock for 100 and a year later it's traded for 150, you have a capital gain of 50 euro in my example. But, and that's, I don't want to say that's beautiful, but yeah, it's, that's a fact. Accounting-wise, this would be called unrealized holding gain because you don't have to pay taxes on it. You don't have to pay taxes for it for a while. As long as you're holding the stock, you have not earned any income. You bought, let's say today, a stock for 100, then fast forward a year and the stock is traded for 150. You still have the stock. Mathematically, you already know, aha, 
boom, I've made a capital gain of 50, the difference, but only under the condition that you sell the stock. So until you sell the stock, you have zero income, and that means you don't have tax payments. So that's actually kind of handy for you, because you can pick then when you pay taxes. You pay taxes when you sell the stock, and the unrealized holding gain becomes really an actual capital gain. And how does this connect to what we're discussing? Imagine the tax rate on the interest income in the case where you give a loan to the firm is different than the income tax that you pay on the capital gains that you would earn as a shareholder. So that is why we need to consider personal taxes. Does this make sense for now at least? Is everyone on board, guys? Yes, no? Yes. Super. Okay, nice. So last but not least, how does this all fit into the overall big picture? We are talking about a theory that supposedly helps us understand capital structure in the real world. Why do firms have very different capital structures? Why is it not all that? And then we say, naja, maybe the trade-off theory can help. We know that trade-off means weighing different things against each other, advantages and disadvantages. And then we say, let's list all the advantages and all the disadvantages and see what we get. Okay? So that is basically what should influence our final decision. I would like that here you make 10 exclamation marks. 10 exclamation marks, please. I will guide you through this. I will guide you through this. Let's focus on the diagram on the left first, okay? I will explain every single, every single thing here. I need, uh, I need my drawing. Pew. All right. So what is, it, what is it that we're looking at? On the x-axis, we see here basically the debt equity ratio again. How much debt does the firm use? Just like in the diagrams, the two I showed you before, an all equity firm would be here. And the more to the right you go, the higher the leverage the firm uses, so the more debt in its capital structure. And on the other axis, I plot again the value of the firm. And now, and that's maybe a little bit confusing in this diagram, this one diagram shows three very different theories, three very different approaches. Modigliani-Miller without taxes, Modigliani-Miller with taxes, and the trade off theory. Let's start with Modigliani-Miller without taxes first. So, in a world without taxes, the amount of leverage does not influence firm value. That means no matter if you're zero levered, so all equity, or very highly levered, firm value remains the same. I plot firm value on this axis, so if I say it remains the same, what it means is it will be a flat line. Whoop! This is this here. That is Modigliani Miller, MM, no tax. Number one, done. How is this in a world with taxes? So Modigliani Miller with taxes, with corporate tax. In a world with corporate taxes, companies get to enjoy the tax advantage of debt. So that means the more leverage, the more debt in your capital structure, the higher your interest expenses, the higher your interest expenses, the lower your profit before tax, the lower your profit before tax, the lower your eventual tax payment. So that means the value of a firm will go up as the firm increases leverage. So this is Modigliani Miller, MM with tax, which led us to this weird prediction. If that really were to hold in the real world, we would only observe fully debt financed firms, firms that have 100% debt. And in both, in both instances, we said that's not the case. This is not the case in the real world. This is not the case in the real world. So what is then the case in the real world? I need a different color. I need, um, bum, 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 bum. I need green. All right. So how is this really? According to the trade-off theory. We are starting our consideration at this point. 
Okay, let me just write this down. All, oops, all equity. So this here is where an all equity firm would be, meaning if the firm has only equity in its capital structure, this is what the firm value would be in the real world. And then the firm says, let's start to lever up, let's increase leverage in our capital structure. Then initially, firm value would go up, 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 up. Why? In this phase, in this increase phase of the firm value, why would the firm value increase? That is like Modigliani Miller predicted in a world with taxes. That is because of the tax shield. It increases until a certain point, until this point here. If you then increase leverage beyond this point, oops, beyond this point, what will happen to your firm value? It will actually go down again. That is what you see here now. Firm value will decrease then. And the question is why? What is basically pressing down, and not only pressing down on firm value, but pressing down so hard on firm value that the disadvantages outweigh the advantages of the tax shield? What is causing this downward slope now? And that is this here. The present value of financial distress costs. So there is a point where the present value of the financial distress costs is so high that they become higher than the, the mathematical advantages of the tax shield. And then the firm value will decrease again. So which capital structure should a firm go for then? Well, the company should pick the point, should the, the, the amount of debt, that basically is here. What happens at this point? If I use this amount of debt, so that's really, you have to imagine that's a euro amount. That could be, I don't know, I'm just making stuff up, 100,000 euro, let's say. And I don't know as a firm, as a manager, if I use this amount of debt, I will end up at this point of the firm value, meaning it cannot go up anymore because I, if I increase the amount of debt in our capital structure only by one more cent, firm value would already start to go down. Okay? So far, so clear. Is everyone on board? All right. So, as you can already see, this connects very nicely to our, our starting consideration. You can already now make a bit of an, uh, 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 no, I don't want to say guess. You can have already a small opinion on if there is one optimal capital structure that's true for all firms or not. If you look at this and think about it very hard, you must realize there cannot be one optimal amount of debt for all firms. I will explain, of course, in a bit uh, uh, much more, but the reason for that must be the present value of the distress costs. The tax shield, the magnitude is the same for the firms, but the present value of financial distress costs, costs differ. So there are firms where, where the financial distress costs start to weigh very early on, these firms would have then a, a, a firm value development, maybe something looking like something looking like this. The company increases leverage, but the financial distress costs start to weigh down on the firm value much earlier. And other firms, maybe firms that are considered very established, very reliable, where the CEO possibly is for a change totally sane and doesn't tweet crazy shit all the time, a firm like that might actually be able to digest more debt in its capital structure before the firm value goes down. So the key difference here would be the present value of the financial distress costs, okay? To be elaborated on more in a bit. This diagram is clear? Yes, no? Let me hop into the chat quickly. I'm assuming also, if there's a pressing question, some of you will unmute and shout at me. All right. Okay. What does this diagram on the other side mean then? It shows kind of the same thing in a slightly different way. So the x-axis is identical. What you see here is all equity at this point and an increase in leverage to this, to this side. Nothing fancy here. But 
on the y-axis, I'm not plotting firm value now, I plot the cost of capital. Okay? I plot the WACC. So if a firm is all equity, what will the WACC of the firm be? And that is something where I think I can add value just to clarify your thinking. If a firm is all equity, what will the WACC of that firm be? It will be this point here, ah, R0, also called RA. Oops, RA. So that's really this only at this one point, the unlevered cost of equity. And as the firm then increases leverage, meaning it takes on more debt in its capital structure, it moves to the right, the WACC will go down, 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 to a certain point where, as you can see, it is lowest. So at this point, with this amount of debt, which is ex exactly the same amount here, the company has now not max, well, at the same time has maximized firm value, but how? By minimizing the WACC, by minimizing its discount rate. If then the firm says, awesome, let's increase leverage further, then the WACC would go up again. Why is that? Present value of financial distress costs. Okay, so these diagrams, if I were a student, I would basically cut them out and put them below each other that you really see this, this line here, dot, 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 go through both diagrams that you see, this is the firm value, this is plotting the cost of capital and the x-axis is the same. It shows what happens as you increase leverage to two different concepts, to firm value and to your cost of capital, to the WACC. Guys, is everybody on board? Is also everybody on YouTube on board? Is there anything in the chat that you, you feel I should address? Hi. Hello. Uh, could you uh, re-explain what the um, financial distress cost is? I, was I, I have not explained it yet, so no need, no need to, no need to, no need to uh, worry about it. I have not really elaborated on what that is. So. Safe, boop. All right, let's move on. Happy that you provided a nice transition for me. What about the financial, uh, uh, the, the cost of financial distress? Let's talk about this. I would, I would like to, let me see, let me check the time. I would like to finish this and then have a break. Five minutes, all right? So we need to distinguish between bankruptcy risk and a bankruptcy cost. A risk is a probability, a cost is, I mean, cold hard cash. So obviously the possibility, the probability of a bankruptcy has a negative effect on the value of the firm, but it's not the risk of bankruptcy itself that lowers the value, it's actually the costs that are associated with a bankruptcy or with financial distress that cause this reduction in firm value. A bit of a side note, the shareholders bear these costs. And of course I need to elaborate what that means. <coughs> I have a brief example here. I will spare you the example because it's, I mean, you just click through it. It just drives home an incredibly easy point that I don't want to, you know, elaborate on. Wait, it's on the slides. Please click through it. Don't spend more than five minutes on it because you won't need more than five minutes. If this gives you trouble in the next lecture, immediately when we start, say, hey, dude, explain again. And of course I will. But this is just needlessly complicated in my view. Let me show you. Let me show you what the financial distress costs really are. There are two things I would like you to distinguish between. So we are saying, brief, brief, brief sort of recap. We are saying firm value goes up as a company increases leverage because of the beautiful advantage of the tax shield of debt. But the firm value only goes up to a certain point. If you then keep levering up, increasing debt, firm value will go down again. Why does it go down? Because the, financial, the, the, the cost of financial distress press it down. But what are the costs of financial distress? Well, we need to distinguish now between two different kinds of costs of financial distress. Direct costs and indirect costs. 
The direct costs are uh, not very complicated. The indirect costs also not, but they are more interesting, I think. Let's talk about direct first. So what are direct costs of financial distress? Well, legal and administrative costs. Um, there could be, of course, delays in paying out certain cash flows. Why would, you, would there be delays? Because the firm is distressed, extremely liquidity constrained, so obviously all payments will occur with a massive delay. These are typically not very big for large companies because a large company has a legal department. They don't need to, you know, go, go, go crazy. This is typically not the problem. The problem is typically the indirect costs. They are much bigger. What could that be? Let's go through it. Loss in revenue because customers get reluctant to buy from us. So how does that manifest? It manifests in a decrease in revenue. It makes perfect sense. Imagine you have saved your money for 20 years and you say, now I'm ready to have my dream house built. Uh, and you're looking on Google, which construction company sh is, should you select for building your dream house? Would you select a company to build your dream house? The construction will take, let's say, one and a half years, of which you know it is struggling mightily financially. No, of course not. You would say, shit, if I hire this company and they go bankrupt after half a year, my money is gone. And the only thing I get is maybe a fundament or a, a finished basement, but the rest of my house is not here. So you would simply avoid doing business with such a firm because there's plenty of choice. This is clearly different for different firms. So let's say the cafeteria on our campus, we are financially distressed. I just it's just an invented example. And you go there and you consider, should I buy a cappuccino, yes or no? You would not say, well, I need to do a financial statement analysis first. I don't want to buy my cappuccino from a distressed firm, obviously. So that matters for products with a higher value and products typically that are where the construction takes longer or where the warranty matters. So you don't want to, for example, buy a car. Imagine Tesla were distressed. You buy a Tesla, two days after you buy your whatever, 75,000 euro new Tesla, the company goes out of business and then something, after a week, something breaks in your car. I mean, where do you go? The warranty is basically meaningless because the company is not existing anymore. So you would pick a different company. That's what I'm saying here. And that makes the company, the distressed company, miss out on revenues. Number two. What, we're still talking about indirect costs of financial distress. What else do we have here? Suppliers want instant cash. Imagine I'm a distressed firm. You are my suppliers. What I do is I, uh, I don't know, I produce uh, computers and you are a supplier who produces uh, specific chips for me. Typically, we have an ongoing business relationship. You keep delivering chips for me. And at the end of the year, we, we have a look how many of these chips did I use. And for these chips, I pay you then after the year is over. You as a supplier would never grant credit to me if you knew that I was financially distressed. You would want that I pay immediately with cold hard cash. But how is this a cost? I mean, I have to anyway pay for the chips that you delivered to me. Yeah, true, but I need now more working capital. Typically, I can delay the payments till the end of the year but now you want to be paid instantaneously. That means during the year, I need more cash. So that means I need to increase my liquidity and that money needs to come from somewhere. Okay. And last but not least, that, is, that matters very much in the real world. Side note, please make a note if you want to. My, my research deals with exactly this or parts of my research. Companies that are financially distressed typically encounter brutal differences, uh, difficulties in raising new capital. Imagine a firm is distressed, needs of course more money, capital on the right side of the balance sheet. What can they do? Issue new shares or get a bank loan. And then ask yourself, would you want to be the shareholder of a firm that already as they offer you new shares, uh, that's already distressed? You would say, no, no way I will be a shareholder there because as a shareholder, how do James oh, Sorry. As a shareholder, you don't have a guarantee to receive dividends to begin with. And if the firm is already distressed, I mean, what's the probability that you will ever see dividends? I mean, zero. 
what's the probability that you ever get your investment back? Also zero. And you say, well, should I give a loan to the company? Maybe in the form of being a bondholder? Also not. Because if the company goes bankrupt, sure, you have a legal claim on the proceeds from the firm's assets. But I told you, in the average bankruptcy, when a whole firm gets liquidated, the proceeds from liquidating a whole firm is typically on average only enough to pay between 2 and 4% of all the outstanding debt. That means between 98 and uh, 96% of all creditors get exactly zero. So that means in a bankruptcy, when a firm is liquidated, you don't get much. So that means if you as a distressed firm need to raise more capital, you will not get it from the equity market. You will very likely not get it from the, from the debt markets either. So what are you going to do? This is now very, very advanced and I don't want to... I don't want to really bother you with it, but I would like to ask you, because I know some of you know, because we've been texting about it, when a firm is distressed in this way, as I've described, there's severe rationing on the equity market going on, meaning equity markets don't give you money. There's severe rationing in the debt markets, meaning the debt markets will not give you money. Any ideas which instrument could help you? Say again. Uh, maybe bonds, bonds. Yeah, a bond. A bond would be an instrument of debt. It would be an instrument of debt. You're not completely wrong, but it's a special kind of bond. We have not discussed it, so it's really completely as a side. Yeah, very nice, Enrique. Very, very nice. Absolutely correct. Convertible bonds can help here. Like I said, this is really a side note. And I'm only bringing it up because it's my own research. A convertible bond is a hybrid. It's between debt and equity because it has characteristics of equity, but also characteristics of debt. Really, side note, you can tune out if you're not interested. Perfectly fine. A convertible bond starts as a normal bond, so as, a, as an instrument, as a debt instrument. But if you, as an investor, buy the convertible bond that I have issued, you have the right, if you so choose, to convert it later on into equity. So that means I issue such an instrument. If you buy it, initially you are a creditor, a bondholder, but later on, if you want, you can become a shareholder like this. Why would you, in an instance like this, maybe still buy such an instrument? Because initially a convertible bond is just a bond, meaning you have a strong legal claim, no matter if you will get it through or not. But if the company manages a turnaround, maybe it's just a temporary crisis because of Corona or something, you need to sit out two or three years as an investor, the company recovers, the share price goes through the roof and you are sitting nice and pretty on a bond, you see the share price grow and at some point you say, and now I convert into equity. And magically, almost magically, your bond disappears and becomes a share and you're eligible to participate in dividends. So a convertible bond as an instrument is a great tool, not only for startups, but it's a great tool for companies that are distressed to such a degree that the equity, the pure equity and the pure debt market will not help them anymore. If you're interested in this, I happily post on Canvas the paper I wrote about it. It's not published yet, we're in the publishing process. It's a very, very cool case study paper uh, of Dutch history. So if you're into this and you specifically uh, want to know a little bit more here, I happily post it and just send me a message and, and I will do so. Guys, thank you for your patience for now. I think it's really time for a quick break. All right. Shall we reconvene here in 10 minutes? Is that possible? 10 minutes? Nice.
Guys, we start in two minutes. Slowly get ready. Come back to me, guys. Come back. Everybody back? All right. Uh, obviously, in my, in, my, in my enthusiasm, I, of course, forgot the punchline when I was talking about raising new equity and uh, new capital. What's the problem of that? Why is this an indirect cost? Because obviously, you as a firm want to raise capital. Why? Because you need the capital to invest in positive net present value investment opportunities. If you cannot find financing for these projects, you have to forego them. Means you cannot do them. So you miss out on potential revenue and potential increases in the value of your firm. That is the problem. Okay. All right. We have ta talked now about all kinds of market frictions. What are market frictions? Well, it's the opposite of perfect capital markets. Markets where everything is not perfect, where there are frictions that distort basically the markets. We have talked about bankruptcy and distress costs. These frictions limit the use of debt, limit the benefits of the use of debt. But there are other frictions that matter, the agency costs. And this is something that we need to talk about. We are talking about agency costs of uh, of debt, not right now agency cost of equity, okay? So when, let me go back, Whoop. here, potential costs of debt, so disadvantages of debt financing, we have here the second bullet point, agency costs of debt, such as underinvestment, incentive to focus on risky projects, paying out cash dividends, this is where we zoom in now, okay? This is what we will talk about now, okay? So, so there is now something happening when you stop being an all-equity firm and you move, uh, you, uh, you increase your leverage, you become a levered firm, there will be conflicts of interest between shareholders and bondholders, okay? So based on me being the manager, my contract, my employment being dependent on the opinion of shareholders, my salary dependent on the opinion of the shareholders regarding my performance, take an educated guess who I, as the CEO, will be loyal to. The creditors, like bondholders, or the shareholders. Yes, you're absolutely right. I will be very, very tempted to pursue strategies that maximize shareholder wealth. Yeah, in principle, that's not a problem. In a, in, 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 in a Modigliani Miller world, maximizing, uh, maximizing shareholder value is the same as maximizing firm value, so that's all cool. But we have stopped living in a Modigliani Miller world. All of a sudden, we're in the real world, and in the presence of debt, five exclamation marks, in the presence of debt in the capital structure, maximizing shareholder value 
does not necessarily have to be the same anymore as maximizing firm, uh, firm value. Well, let me put it a different way. In, uh, in, the, in the world, which is not perfect, it's not a perfect capital market, there are market frictions, maximizing shareholder value can be done at the expense of somebody else. Of whose expense? Of bondholders. Okay, so this is what we talk about. Third bullet point, five exclamation marks. In the presence of debt, maximizing shareholder value does not need to be the same as maximizing firm value. Let me rephrase it in not just human language, but in the simplest hum human language that I can come up with. When we are looking at a firm that is not all equity, so when we are looking at a levered firm, I, as the CEO, have plenty of ways to help benefit my shareholders. How? By screwing over the bondholders. That's what I'm going to describe now, okay? I will briefly tell you how that works with dividends. I will show you a, a relatively elaborate example on focusing on risky projects. And under investment, I have covered super neatly on the slides. That's for you to click through yourself, okay? Three ways that we talk about. Taking on high-risk projects, under investing, paying out an extra dividend. Let's talk about the third bullet point first because it's easy, it's intuitive, let's get it done. How can I, as the CEO of a firm, of a levered firm, benefit the shareholders at the expense of bondholders? Certain, certain, well, certain parameters need to be present first. So we are looking now exclusively at firms that are already to some degree financially distressed. What can I as a manager do to help out my shareholders at the expense of the bondholders? Before we go bankrupt, I can declare an extraordinary cash dividend. Whatever cash is at this point still left in the firm, I pack up, send it to you. Good news, extraordinary cash dividend. Two minutes later, we declare bankruptcy. Then everything will be liquidated, but everything of value is already gone. So the bondholders get really screwed over in a hard way. What I'm describing would be exactly, well, what I've, what I've advertised, benefiting shareholders at the, expense of, at the expense of bondholders. But I want to be fully honest. This extreme scenario I've just described, right before bankruptcy, I clean out the firm, I sell everything of value and all the cash I declare as an extra cash dividend for you guys, pay it out to you, we go bankrupt and what is left of the firm is a bunch of liabilities and no assets. If you, you can do this in the real world. If you do this in the real world, jail. You definitely go to jail for this. So at the beginning of my actual non-academic career in finance, I was working in an office where we were working for really courts of law that asked us then to determine the specific point in time, really like a date and sometimes even a time of the day, when the CEO must have been aware that the company will go bankrupt. Because if I have done the extra cash dividend before this point, all is cool. If you do this after, you must have known that the firm will go bankrupt, jail. Okay? So this is not a very sophisticated scheme. And in the worst case, this really leads to jail. And lawsuits like you would not believe. Does the, but does the mechanic make sense to you how I can utilize extra extraordinary dividends to benefit shareholders? at the expense of bondholders. Does this make sense? Super, okay. Let's talk on about the second point, taking on high-risk projects. And don't forget, don't get lost in details, okay? Whenever you are at the risk of getting lost in details, ask yourself, what is it that we're talking about? We are talking about situations in levered firms where shareholders can enjoy benefits at the expense of, at the expense of bondholders. Co classic conflicts of interest, okay? Let's look at taking on high-risk projects. It's a brief example, but I think it showcases quite nicely what's going on. We are looking at a levered firm, obviously, because in an all-equity firm, you would not have these conflicts of interest. Uh, the, co the, the levered firm has to make 100 pounds of interest and principal payments to debt holders. So they're repaying a loan uh, in the next period. The company has to choose between two mutually exclusive projects. So the, the company has some degree of debt financing. 
they are of course still operating, engaging in all kinds of new projects, and for they have to make not a choice between two projects. They are mutually exclusive, meaning the firm can only do one of the two. The two projects are fundamentally different. One is very low risk and the other one is high risk. Let's look at it some more. The low risk, should we engage in the low risk project, we would, uh, uh, we would earn 100 pounds if the economy is in recession and we would earn 200 pounds if the economy goes into a boom phase. We don't know what will happen. 50% probability of uh, a recession, 50% probability of a boom. If there's a recession, the low risk project will pay 100. If the economy goes into a boom, the low risk project will pay 200. And the high risk project would pay only 50 in a recession, but 240 in a boom. We assume now that boom and recession are equally likely, 50-50 uh, probability. The question now is, which projects will the shareholders, or of course a manager who is an agent of the shareholders, choose? You have to imagine, logically, I as a, as a manager, I'm not really a completely free agent. I'm to some degree dependent on your mercy. If you are dissatisfied with my work as shareholders, you can vote me out, you can fire me. All right, so I obviously have a big interest in keeping my shareholders happy. Which projects would you choose? Let's look at it systematically. I guide you through it, it's not rocket science. So here we have, so first of all, we start with a low risk project. Imagine we pick the low risk project and not the high risk, low risk project. In either, in either of the two projects, we have to face the uncertainty of the future. There could be an economic recession, there could be an economic boom. Both are equally likely. Therefore, both have a probability of occurring with 50%. What happens uh, in the, in the, in the, in the, if we choose the low risk project in each of the scenarios, we need to calculate the expected value of the firm and we need to calculate the expected value only of the equity. Let's do that. So the expected value of the whole firm is 50% probability, so the recession scenario probability, multiplied with 100, that's the earnings of the low risk project in a recession, plus 50% probability of a boom, multiplied with the earnings that we will have in the boom phase, so the 200. So the expected value of the firm would be then 150 pounds. How will that play out? Let me go back one slide. We have to, we are levered, we have outstanding debt, we need to pay interest expenses. 100, that's given to us. So let's, let's see how this will play out. If we uh, end up in the, the recession scenario, all the money that we have available, all our beautiful earnings of 100, has to go to the bondholders, right? The bondholders have given basically the loan to us, they earn what I call interest expense, their interest income. So the 100 earning goes straight to the bondholders. How much is left for you guys, my shareholders? Yeah, nothing. Because all the 100 earnings I had to spend on our interest expenses. That's why we have here zero for the shareholders. If, however, we find ourselves in the boom scenario, what happens then? In the boom scenario, we agreed, that's given to us, that the firm will have earnings of 200. So that means we can pay our interest expense and there is still another 100 then left that I can give to the shareholders, right? That's what you see here, the 100. So what is then the expected value for the shareholders of this project? Well, we simply need to figure out now the expected value, so probability times outcome plus probability times outcome from your view, from the shareholders view. So there is a 50% probability of the recession scenario in which you guys, shareholders, get zero. That's what you see here. And there's a 50% probability of the boom scenario in which you, shareholders, get the 100. So what's the expected value of this project from the shareholder perspective? 50 pounds. Brief, brief, brief sort of sidebar. Is everyone on board so far? Everyone understands how I cooked up this table. Perfect, super, okay. 
This is a low risk project. We do now exactly the same thing for the high risk project. We still have the two scenarios, recession and boom. They're both equally likely, 50%, 50%. Let's check out what will happen. Let me go back. In, if we choose the high risk project, we will earn 50 pounds in recession and 250 pounds in the boom. Yet we have to make interest payments in either scenario of 100. So imagine we are in the recession scenario. In the recession scenario, we will have earnings of only 50, yet we owe interest expenses from our view of 100. So I need to pay the full 50, there's nothing left and actually we are not even paying in full here. Already our bondholders miss out on, on 50 pounds here, right? Consequently, nothing left for shareholders. That is in the recession scenario. What about the boom scenario? In the boom scenario, the, the project, the high risk project will earn, will generate earnings of 240 pounds. So if we earn 240 pounds, we can afford to pay the interest expense in full and there will be something extra left. The difference, 140, which we can pay out to the shareholders, to you guys. So what is then the expected value of the firm? And what is the expected value for the shareholders? Let's, let's check this out. The value of the expected value of the firm, probability times payoff plus probability times payoff. So we have 50% times the 50 pounds plus 50% probability times the 240. So if we pick the high risk project, the firm value will be 145. Overall, the value of the firm for bondholders and shareholders together. If, in a second step, we calculate now the expected value of the equity, in the recession scenario, we have probability times payoff. As a shareholder, you get nothing in the recession, so 50% times zero plus 50% probability of the boom multiplied with the 140 that you could get as a dividend. That gives us an expected value of equity of 70. I have, now, I have now two questions for you. Question number one. Imagine you are the, the manager of this firm. You have to choose between the low risk project and the high risk project. And your objective is to maximize firm value. Which project will you choose? Unmute yourself or sound off in the chat. The low, risk. low risk. If your objective is to maximize firm value. Low risk, different opinions. Let me check the chat. Yeah, nice. Why is that? Well, it's very easy. The expected value of the firm in the low risk scenario is 150. In the high risk scenario, it's only 145. If your objective is to maximize firm value, which it should be, you would pick the low risk project because 150 is more than 145. However, knowing now that the real world is a bit messy and that there are market frictions, that there are legal uh, dependencies. I, as a CEO, want to keep you guys, my shareholders, happy. Which project do you think I will really choose as a manager? Uh, probably the second one, because you maximize the shareholder value. Full points. Absolutely correct. Very nice. Very nice. Absolutely correct. I, my objective is not to keep bondholders and shareholders happy. My objective as the manager is to keep shareholders happy. So even though I know that the high risk project is not maximizing firm value, it does maximize shareholder value. So you see this, this is almost like gambling now. I'm betting on basically the high risk project. Why? Because in the low risk scenario, the shareholders only can expect 50 pounds. And in the high risk scenario, they can expect 70 pounds. I want to keep the shareholders happy, so I would now pick the high risk project at the expense of whom? At the expense of the bondholders, of course. Because should we find ourselves here in the recession scenario, already we are not able to pay our interest expense. See, in this year, the 50, that is what the bondholders already miss out on, okay? Why are we talking about this? Let's not forget the big picture ever. The big picture is in the presence of debt, so for levered firms, maximizing shareholder value does not need to be the same as maximizing firm value. 
I rest my case. Sorry, can I ask a question? Of course. Um, why in this case are we not taking value of the firm for the high risk one for the recession scenario as minus 50 since we're actually like 50 in the, like the payoff is 50 but our debt is 100? Why would we like just keep the, the 50 that's positive and not that? We are really considering here actual cash flows. We are not considering here legal claims or anything like this. We are considering only the flow of cold hard cash. And there is no other cash flow here. You are certainly right in a legal, I mean, you can make a legal argument easily that 50 euro or 50 pounds, sorry, are still open. Definitely the case. But don't forget in a bankruptcy, yeah, sure, the bondholders have a legal claim. Good luck with that. So we are really only concerned here with actual cash flow. Okay, that's basically the explanation. Is this clear, guys? Okay, this checks out because, where is it? In the presence of debt, maximizing shareholder value does not need to be the same as maximizing fir firm value. The first example I gave you was dividend payments, extra cash dividend payments in times of financial uh, distress to keep cash from the bondholders and benefit the shareholders. Number one. Number two. We looked now at, sorry, taking on high risk projects. There is a third example under investing. I have mapped this out on the slides as well. It's this example here. As you see, I've worked it out really step by step for you. That's for you to click through, okay? Nothing here really to not understand, but should you not understand something, then ask me next lecture and we go through it quickly as well. Okay, okay. Brief recap. What is the essence of trade-off theory? So the worst is behind you. Let's, let's talk quickly. Let's recap the essence of trade-off. So first of all, there are benefits to debt. The benefits of debt basically make sure that the value of the firm goes up as the firm increases leverage, as the firm takes on more debt. However, the, the, the debt does not only bring advantages, it also brings disadvantages the costs associated with that. They actually make sure that the corporate value, the value of the firm, will go down if you increase leverage only enough. So that is how we get this curved line. We get a, first an increase in firm value because of the benefits. But at some point, the disadvantages of debt financing will outweigh the benefits of that and push down firm value. That is why the curve then slopes downward. Furthermore, the trade-off theory should theoretically help us finding the optimal balance between the advantages of debt, of debt financing, and the disadvantages, so the costs of debt financing. Where would that be? I showed you two diagrams where you can literally with your finger point at the optimal um, capital structure. The, 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 the magnitude of debt is optimal when firm value peaks, so as firm value is maximized. And as firm value is maximized, at the same time, the weighted average cost of capital will be minimized. That were the two diagrams we have discussed. Yeah? Okay, we have to address why there is not an optimal leverage ratio, so an optimal debt to equity mix that exists for all firms, we have to diagnose the mixed debt to equity, optimal mix, must be firm specific. But why is that? Why is it not that I can look up what's the best mix debt to equity, 30, 70%, something like that. Why is it firm specific? The reason for that is direct and indirect bankruptcy costs, so the direct and, in, and indirect costs of financial distress are determined by firm specific parameters by the size of the firm, by the nature of its business, by the way it handles its supply chain, its customers. That is all firm specific. And by extension, the indirect costs of financial distress, the indirect bankruptcy costs are firm specific. So that means the, the shape, the downward sloping shape will be very different between different firms. That's why there is no general cooking recipe. That's why when you read somewhere, yeah, Netflix has whatever, 80% debt, that's way too high. I would recommend uh, whatever, the golden number, 40% debt. 
pure nonsense, pure nonsense. And I want that you understand why. It's because of this. You need to factor in the specificity of the company in question. And you really need to analyze this. And full disclosure, I mean, I make it sound like you can calculate it like this. How do you determine, just this one point, how much revenue will you miss out on when your firm is distressed by customers not wanting to do business with you? I mean, ask yourself when you construct an Excel sheet, can I really find this out? Can I know this for sure? No, of course not. Okay, so again, don't make the mistake, as, as we've discussed in the context of, let's say, net present value. Yeah, we have a sophisticated Excel sheet with 50 million digits after the comma, but our input parameters are notoriously wishy-washy, I want to say. Guesstimates, okay? Last but not least, you can reduce your costs of debt in all kinds of different ways. The key word here that I would like you to read up on is using protective covenants. This is, I always make references to edition three because I got the sense that more of you use edition three. Um, otherwise, just look it up, cost of debt or protective covenants in the index of the book. I just want to translate this quickly. Protective obviously means to protect against something, sure. Covenant, it's just a complicated finance term for basically rules that banks will apply when they give you a loan. So for example, I have a house in Rotterdam, it's 100% debt financed, and I have a ton of covenants in my contract. For example, I'm not allowed to rent out my house to anybody without the bank consenting. And the reason for that is, if I were to rent out my house, I would make a separate contract, let's say with you, and you move in. I'm your landlord, you pay your rent to me. However, I have not repaid my mortgage fully. So let's say I'm unable or unwilling to pay my bank, then my bank will say, hey dude, that is not okay. Legally, your house is the collateral, it's the security of the loan. Since you stopped paying, I will take away your house and sell it and recover the loan in this way, fine. So then all of a sudden, you live in my house, you have rented it, the bank knocks and says, get the fuck out, I'm sorry, get out, and, and, and uh, we need to sell the house. But it's not so easy, because rent law applies, and rent law in the Netherlands is very, very much on the side of people renting a house. So the bank would not be able to get you out of the house. So even though they have the legal claim to sell my house, based on me having entered a contract with you, landlord and, and, and renting party, the, the bank cannot basically capitalize on the, on the collateral. So that's why the bank insisted on a protective covenant that says I'm not allowed to rent it out. Okay, in the co in context of firms, there are many more covenants that could be chosen. For example, typically large companies are not allowed to sell huge assets without asking the bank for permission simply because the assets might serve as collateral, okay? That's nothing complicated, it's just something you read through, it's a bit of a list of bullet points, things the bank can force you, the firm, to do in order to reduce their risk exposure. If the risk for the bank goes down, obviously they will agree to a lower interest rate, and the interest rate is, of course, boop, cost of debt, okay? So that's how that connects. We are almost at the end of our actual lecture. I want to, beside talking about the trader theory, I want to introduce you to the pecking order theory. That's another approach to capital structure explanations in the real world. Don't forget why we are doing all of this. We're trying to understand, first of all, what firms should be doing, and we're trying to understand what firms really are doing. We approach this using Modigliani Miller, without taxes, with taxes, then we dropped assumptions like crazy and we moved to the trade-off theory. The trade-off theory tells us what firms should do. So I would say brief sidebar for students that are very much into philosophy. This is a theory that is normative. A normative theory tells us what you should do, what you ought to do. It does not tell us necessarily what people are actually doing. The pecking order theory, I would say, is a descriptive theory. It merely describes what's happening, okay? It's called pecking order. That's, not a, that's actually not complicated finance, blah, blah. That is complicated biology, blah, blah. 
uh, that we have just uh, basically adopted in finance. What is it about? It's an alternative theory that tries to explain capital structure choice that we really observe in the, in the real world. The difference between, well, there are plenty of differences, but the sort of conceptual difference between trade-off and pecking order is that the, the pecking order theory is behavioral in nature. So this has to do with behavior, with signaling. I will elaborate. So in finance, just like in biology, that's where we have stolen it, it could very well be the case that there is a certain hierarchy that is of interest, a hierarchy that matters. So when we are, when we are dealing with pecking order theory, the question that we ask is, what should a company issue first, debt or equity? Let's hop into this a bit more. It's not complicated. Packing order theory states that what firms do, they work, so, sorry, let me start over. A company that needs capital for their projects, they look at interesting investment opportunities, they need to be financed. The company says, yeah, but how should we finance it? Debt or equity? And then the company basically goes through always the same steps and, to, and, and tries to find out what's best. Step one, companies seem to favor free cash flow first. So that means the company has built up from profits of the past a ton of retained earnings. Why would companies like to use this in a first step? Basically finance themselves internally straight out of their retained earnings. It's really nice because I as the manager don't need to ask anybody for permission. I don't need to justify that to the shareholders. I don't need to beg the banks. Uh, and maybe the project is so advanced and I'm such a visionary that nobody beside me can see the merit of the project I'm proposing. So instead of focusing my energy on convincing people that it's an awesome project, I can simply say, fine, we have to retain the earnings. Boom, let's use it. And I will show you that the project is worth undertaking. So that is easy, convenient, the money is already there. If there is not enough free cash flow, so retained earnings available, what would be then the second favorite option that companies pick? They would issue debt. Please observe the exclamation mark here. That's something that not only students, but people find weird. It should not be weird, I'll elaborate. Issue debt is the second step. Why? Because you could offer collateralized securities. That is just complicated finance language for, you could issue a normal bond. So basically you ask people to buy your bond, which means they give a loan to you. Collateralized simply means the bond is under, I, I, I don't know how I should say, the bond is, is, is not exposed to a high risk because I provide certain securities. Like in my example with the mortgage, my mortgage is collateralized. The house itself is the collateral. And collateral is just complicated finance language for some security. Something the bank can take away from me. If I stop paying, they can sell it and recover their loss in that way. So by the firm offering collateralized securities, so bonds with certain securities built in, I can actually, first of all, I can get the cost of that relatively low. And secondly, I can signal something. I can signal that I as the manager, that we as the firm believe in the quality of our project. And more, if anybody observes our firm increasing leverage, they logically must know that we have to pay interest expenses for this. And not paying interest expenses leads to bankruptcy. So if anybody observes our firm increasing leverage, it means, Harupupi, it means, it means that uh, the, the, the management is extremely convinced in the quality of the project. We are signaling that we will be able, that the project is so good that it will allow us in the future to still afford the increase in interest expenses. So it's not just a signal, it is a credible signal. Because I as a manager, I'm a self-serving, of course, guy. If the company goes bankrupt, I'm out of a job. So if you see me, the manager, actively levering up our firm, you know that it means higher interest expenses, you know that I'm worried about my job, but if you still, still see me do it, you must 
come to the conclusion, oh yeah, he seems to be quite confident that this will not screw up our firm totally, that we will still be able to service the debt. So clearly, he's talking about a good project. It is a credible signal. Every, every manager would say, oh, believe me, that's a great project. Yeah, sure, everybody would say this. Um, but this makes it credible. If you have no free cash flow available, if you cannot issue debt, what is the last step in the pecking order to obtain capital? Equity. Equity is really the last resort. If we only consider internal financing debt and equity, there are some exceptions, but this is how it, how it plays out. You would issue equity only after you have exhausted everything else. Okay? Now, of course, we need to talk about why is equity last? How is that possible? Why is equity last? So, number one, we can immediately say right off the bat, equity is more expensive than debt for a legal reason. In case of bankruptcy, outstanding debt is paid first before shareholders get anything. Shareholders, we have discussed this a million times, shareholders are exposed to a much higher risk, so shareholders demand a higher return. This connects neatly, of course, to the capital asset pricing model, CAPM, right? But there are more reasons. That's really, this is now brain jerk off, I have to say. I like it, it's not complicated. We are now addressing why equity should be last in the packing order. Priority one, priority two, last priority. So the problem in the real world is we all know very different things, meaning there is asymmetric information. So if, if, um, if I'm a manager of a highly specialized firm, I produce whatever, some computer chips, you are just normal shareholders, and I explain to you the merit of a new whatever thread ripper CPU. You might say, dude, I have no idea what a CPU is, let alone what a thread ripper is. I have no idea, I cannot determine if that's a good project or not. So to some degree, I mean, we're just not on the same page. You might believe me, but then again, you might not. So there is highly asymmetric information. We do not have uh, perfect markets, perfect, perfectly efficient markets. Markets in the real world are semi-strong. So that means information is available, but inside information still has value. So that means in the presence of asymmetric information, the company, the management of the company and investors having a different state of knowledge about the world, there are all kinds of problems that reside. You don't really know what you can believe of the stuff that I'm saying. So again, we come back to signaling. In this, in this framework, considering or taking into consideration that the world is filled with asymmetric information, signaling becomes incredibly important. So in a world that is characterized by asymmetric information, issuing debt, so increasing leverage, must be a credible signal for the reason I explained before. Higher leverage means higher interest expenses. So clearly, I as the manager don't want to lose my job. I don't want to see the company go bankrupt. So if you see me increase the leverage of our firm, it is a credible signal that the future of our company looks A-OK. -okay. If you issue equity, if you see me, the, the manager of the firm, issue equity, you cannot, no matter how how friendly you are, you cannot interpret this as a credible signal at all because there is something called the adverse selection problem. The adverse selection problem. Have you heard, be honest with me, in the context of probably macroeconomics, have you heard of the so-called lemons market problem? Does everybody know the lemons market? No. Okay. Never mind. Then I will just show you. So what I'm, I'm, what, I'm about to, what I'm about to explain is called Lemon's Market and it shows the problem that asymmetric information can create. Have a look at this. It is a, it's a thought experiment. It's very easy to understand, so no need to worry. Imagine you are, you are interested in buying a car, but because you're students, you probably are not swimming in money, so you want to buy a used car. So there are plenty of used car uh, companies around. And let's say, let me write it down, I'll explain in a second.
There are two kinds of cars, two kinds of used cars, peaches and lemons. A peach is just a slang term for a used car that is really, really in perfect shape. And a lemon is a used car that looks okay, but it's really a crap car that will fall apart immediately. And we know the distribution of peaches and lemons in the used car market. Roughly 50% of all used cars are peaches and 50% of used cars are lemons. I don't know, you might be super skilled in, in car technology. I'm really not. For me, every car looks pretty much the same. And if you open the hood, I can only diagnose there seems to be an engine in there or not, but I have no idea what I'm looking at. So for the sake of my example, because we're talking about asymmetric information, I assume that you know nothing about cars either. For you, you obviously want a peach. So a peach would have a value to you of 100 euro. Okay, 100. And you come to a used car salesman, me, and you say, hey dude, I'm in the business, in the market for a new car, do you have something? And I show you a car, and I, as it just so happens, I'm really honest. So I show you an amazing peach. In fact, all used cars I sell are peaches. So I show you the car, you don't know me, of course, you just know I'm a used car salesman, you know I have an interest in selling cars. To you, the car looks decent, but you know both cars would look decent to you. What would be a, a, a rational purchase price offer from your perspective then? Tell me. Would be lower than 100, yeah. Yeah, but I agree, Philip. Give me a number. I want to hear really a number now. 50 euros. Say again? 50 euros. Absolutely correct. Can you please give me, give me your, your reasoning? How did you calculate it? Exactly. A lemon has a value of zero to you, zero euro. You don't know what you're looking at, so you indeed calculate an expected value. You simply say 50% probability that I have a peach that would have a value of 100 for me, plus 50% probability of a lemon multiplied with a value that a lemon has for me. So you would offer 50 euro. And the problem is, I would not sell it to you because I only have peaches. If I sell to you for 50, I make a huge loss because I bought it much more expensively. So I will, I, the used car salesman, I find out very quickly that I cannot sell my cars. Nobody wants to give me 100. So I have only one logical choice that I, I, that I can basically pick. I will reduce the quality of my products. So what I will do is, I will make sure that the quality of my cars is such that they have a value of 50 because that's the only offer I seem to get. So what happens is that the quality of the cars goes down. So very quickly, word gets around and people know the peaches that are still available have now only a value of 50. They are not that perfect anymore. You come again to use car salesman, me, what would you offer them? What would be a rational purchase price offer? 25. 25. Very nice. Yeah, for exactly the same reason. Probability times value plus probability times value. Would I, as the used car salesman, sell? Of course not, because they have a value of 50. Again, I will reduce the quality of my products. And we, we do a couple of iterations. So you would then only be willing to pay 12.5. Would I sell? No. Again, I would reduce the quality of my cars. Then we would end up, I'm, I'm just rounding a bit, at 6. Not 3, 1.5, and we're basically at zero. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven iterations until market failure. How many cars have been sold at this point where the market fails? Market failure being defined as not a single car bought or sold. Well, no cars are sold yet. Zero, nothing. No cars sold, and in seven iterations we have market failure. That is the consequence, supposedly, of asymmetric information. So I, as a used car salesman, need to think of a way how I can deal with this. Because I want to sell cars, what can I do? How, or and now zooming out from used cars to real world, how do you deal with asymmetric information? The only way is signaling. How can I, what can I as a used car salesman do to 
not just tell you, but to signal credibly to you that you're really looking at a peach. Many different ways. I could, for example, say, that's the classic, I could say, if the car breaks down in the next five years, then just bring it here and I will repair it for free. Would somebody who sells only lemons give you a five-year warranty? Of course not. So you would interpret correctly as a very credible signal and all of a sudden the information asymmetry between us does not matter anymore. Okay? So that is the problem of information asymmetries. Let me go back to our slides. So, issuing equity is not a credible signal regarding the future of the firm at all. We have a so-called adverse selection problem. I will not go into the big details here now. Um, uh, it is essentially what I've described now in the context of the lemons market holds equally true for issuing new shares of equity. In a nutshell, I just want to say one or two sentences that when you read my slides that you can put it into the correct context. You have to ask yourself the following. You're not a shareholder yet, okay? You're not a shareholder yet. You're just interested in my firm. I'm the manager. I, the firm, needs capital for some cool investment project. So I say, okay, no problem. I'm issuing new shares of our firm. The project is really good, believe me. Please buy my shares, become a shareholder. You, you don't know anything about the project, but you know that I, as the manager of the firm, to the very least, I can control one thing. The one thing I can control, I mean, there's plenty more I can control, but in the context of equity issues, I can control the timing of the equity issue. I can determine when we will sell the new shares to potential investors, potential shareholders, you guys. Do you think I will issue shares in a time where I, the manager, think that our shares are undervalued so that they are traded for an amount less than the fundamental value would suggest? Would I issue shares then? Yes or no? Abs absolutely correct, guys. I would never do this. When would I, as the manager, be most tempted to issue equity? When the firms are grossly overvalued. So when they are traded for an amount that has nothing to do anymore with reality, completely inflated values. So whenever you see an equity announcement, the, the reasoning in the mind of a potential shareholder should be Wait a second, that guy controls the timing of the shares. He would never issue shares when they are undervalued. He would only issue when they are overvalued. So if you, as a potential shareholder, buy when I, the manager, issue shares, it's virtually guaranteed for you that you will buy something at a grossly exaggerated price. You buy overvalued, I don't want to say crap, but I mean you buy overvalued shares. So I know that very often you guys are concerned between what am I telling you in class that is academically relevant versus how is this in the real world. So does any of the stuff I just mentioned, lemons market, information, asymmetry, signaling, does any of this hold up in the real world in the context of equity? And for once I'm now in the awesome position to say, oh yes, our beautiful theories for once check out in the real world. Yes, let me go to the, where is it? I want to show you. On average, a firm, imagine the following scenario, a firm that is already trading its equity at the stock exchange, like Apple, like Google, Microsoft, Tesla, Netflix, you name it. So there are already stocks in circulation. The company needs more capital, however, to expand. And the company engages in what we call an SEO, a seasoned equity, uh, a seasoned public offering, issues new shares. What happens then to the share price? It is really perceived as a signal. It's perceived as a signal that the shares are overvalued because why else would the management issue shares right now? So as I, the manager, issue these new shares, you as shareholders, you're not in principle against buying them, but you're not willing to buy them at the current market price. So what would happen in the real world? In the real world, on average, the share price of existing equity of our firm would drop by about 
There's a name for this. If you're thinking of doing a master in finance later on, you might want to make a note here. That's a very cool topic. Look up, just Google, announcement effects of equity. Announcement effect of equity means this. I, the manager, give a press conference. Good news, guys. There's a new cool product, a new market that we will conquer with our new cool product. The only small detail missing is I need to find a way to finance it. And I have a solution. Let's issue some more shares. The moment I have the press conference, this is really what happens. The share price will drop. That is called announcement effect. So in the real world, you can, this goes further. You can see actually how companies respond to this. I, as a manager, of course, know about the announcement effect and I know what causes it. This information asymmetry between you and me. So I know the moment I say to the public in a press conference, we will issue equity, the share price will drop, which is really painful because very likely my bonus payments depend on a high share price. So what can you always or very often observe in the real world before a company issues equity? They wait and let a bunch of good news pile up. We have discussed this and in the first year course you have discussed this even more so. Whenever I give a press conference, think of the example the other day we had, the company says we will build a new factory or something and that will generate future earnings of a certain amount, the share price immediately reacts just on the announcement alone. So um, I will wait till I have all kinds of good news. Oh, there's a, we have uh, exceeded our earnings expectations. Um, our new product was very well received by customers. So I will wait for a bunch of good news to pile up and then I will drop the bomb. Oh, by the way, we're also issuing some equity to at least partially offset that. And if you're wondering, is this something you can see in a stock price chart? The answer is kind of. Yes, this piling up or allowing for a pile up of good news, this is called stock price run up. So that means every piece of good news that makes it to the public will make the stock price go up, right? By the net present value of whatever the good news are. So that means you will see the stock price increase, 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 increase. And then at a sudden, uh, at a specific point, it will drop. When does it drop? When the manager announces there will be an equity issue. Woof. All right. In the few, uh, last slide. So um, what, what is now really going on in the real world? Well, we know, we see this, that firms really attempt to optimize their capital structure which really is captured well by the trade-off theory. But we see more. It's not as simple as that. But as the circumstances, as the environment changes, expectations, general business environment, as this changes, the companies also want to adjust their capital structure. The problem is adjusting capital structure is costly. It's not as easy as saying, yeah, let's stop being all equity and be all whatever, all debt or something. There are huge costs involved. Investment banks, lawyers, uh, auditors, accountants, marketing department, and so on. So there are huge financing costs. So adjusting your capital structure is not cheap. Let's say it like this. So what we are working on nowadays, what, what we are working with in an attempt to understand capital structure is, the so-called dynamic trade of theory. Dynamic trade of theory basically says what, what happens is that firms let their leverage ratio, so that debt to equity mix or their capital structure, fluctuate within an optimal range of capital structures. So it's not a point like in the diagram, it seems to be more of a range, sometimes a bit more, sometimes a bit less, there's a fluctuation going on. So summing up, we have trade-off theory, but if you zoom in a little bit more, there are actually two sort of families of trade-off theories. The static trade-off theory, that is basically what I've described all lecture. In the real world, it seems to be more dynamic. That's why we call it dynamic trade-off theory, which states there is not a point, like one perfect debt to equity mix, but a range of, and firms allow their capital structure to fluctuate in this sort of corridor um, simply to accommodate the circumstances of the current business environment. The end. The end, guys. Guys, what can I 
what can I what can I do for you? Are there any questions about this? Is there anything where my explanations were less than less than clear? Anything at this point? Let me wait. I need to see the chat. Yeah, you guys, you never need to ask me. Are these concepts uh, that I'm talking about in the lecture are they are they covered in the book? I mean, everything that I, I, I talk about as extensively as this is, of course, drawn from the book. Di um, diagrams, examples, I take straight from the book. So I'm not teaching random stuff here. Sometimes I deviate from the book, uh, but I usually disclose that because I want to add a little bit more value, especially for students that are very much into finance stuff. So you may safely assume whatever I say is in the book unless I say differently. Are we basically learning right now ways to fraud banks? I mean, don't put it like this and don't say this in the, I mean, to your parents or anything like this. But sure, if somebody shows you how something should be done, you can immediately reverse it and say, well, is this not also an instruction how not to do it? I would not encourage this kind of fraud in general, uh, like bondholder expropriation, stuff like this, because it is not a very sophisticated fraud scheme. And it would already be painful emotionally to me to find out that one of my students later on is arrested for some kind of, some kind of uh, uh, financial fraud. But it would be even more painful for me if a student were arrested for a stupid kind of fraud. And that is a stupid kind of fraud. Guys, I think we need to have a break before we hop into our last section. I know this because the cat is biting my toes and I cannot bear the pain any longer. Should we have maybe a bit of a longer break, maybe, maybe 15 minutes? Sound off in, yeah? Okay, guys, let's have a 15, one five minute break. After the break, we do a recap. I have cut out a couple of slides from everything we've seen so far. So what I want to do is, I want to put them all on the smart board and basically connect them logically with each other, asking certain questions that we see at one glance, essentially the stuff we have discussed. And before we stop then, I have prepared, like I said, a couple of questions that should give you a bit of an indication what kind of stuff I like to ask, okay? Guys, awesome. I, I think it's amazing that you're still holding up. I mean, really, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, almost done, 15 minute break, and then we wrap it up, okay? I'll see you in a bit, guys.
All right, guys, come back to me. Come back to me and let's wrap it up. So, so guys, this is really our last section. I want to do a brief recap, everything that we have discussed, uh, trying to connect everything neatly, like I said. Don't be shy if something is unclear. That's why we do this and then immediately speak up and I will do my best to clarify whatever needs clarifying. And at the end of this, I've prepared a couple of questions for you, a little bit of a sort of check-in to see also for yourself, um, where are you roughly? Um, let's have a look. So I have cut out a, 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 a bunch of slides from all the slides that uh, are already available on Canvas. There's nothing new here. I've just selected slides that allow me to walk through a sort of logical narrative, really. So we have start, started our discussion by saying a firm, a firm is essentially represented by its balance sheets, its income statement, cash flow statement, and statement of changes in equity. And then we zoomed in into the balance sheet and we said, okay, on the left side of the balance sheet, we can see all the assets that belong to the company, that the company owns with the idea of using these assets to generate revenue and by extension profits in the future. But of course, and that's what you have discussed in the first year course, how should a company decide if they should buy a certain asset or a certain group of assets, a project, how? The chapter that you want to read up on, if you have forgotten all of this, is called Investment Decision Criteria. There are plenty of them. The most important one, I think, is the net present value. So we started our consideration by saying, okay, a company basically cares about its net present value. I don't need this. This is just by accident on the slide as well. A net present value calculation looks like this. We typically have a cash outflow in year one. Here it's minus 50 pounds. The minus is important because typically when you engage in a project, you first have to pay to get it started. You need to buy the new shop or the new asset or whatever it is that you do. Typically this is a cash outflow. Don't drop the minus. Once you have set up your project, you can start operating and start earning revenue. So that means the future uh, cash flows typically will be positive, like here, plus 12, plus, 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 whatever. But that are all future values. The first cash flow, here the minus 50, that's a present value. Everything else is a future value, but even different future values. This is a future value in year one, one year later. This is a future value in the sixth year. So I cannot simply sum them up and say, yeah, it's positive, let's do it. I need to get them into the same unit. And the way to do this is by discounting. So discounting is the mathematic operation that converts a future value into a present value. So that is what I'm doing here. I discount the first cash flow by one period, two periods, and so on. The last one here by the sixth period. Then I have a bunch of present values that I may add up. It's not called present value calculation, but net present value calculation, because not all of the present values are positive. The first one here is negative, and whenever we sum up in finance something positive and something negative, the result is a net position. So I sum this up and I find the net present value here is minus something. That means if I were, if our firm were to engage in this project, it would mean that firm value is destroyed. How much? Well, six pounds and seven pence. If it's negative, you would not do it. But then we immediately ran into problems. Let me, let me point out the problems. We actually are not even able to calculate this because we don't know what is the appropriate discount rate that we're supposed to use? Well, the discount rate is the cost of capital. So if you say, I need a, 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 a new project, I want to engage in a new project that needs to be financed somehow, what would be then the cost of financing? Well, if it's an all equity firm, it would be the unlevered cost of equity, but we don't see this in the real world. In the real world, it's always some degree of leverage. So we have debt as well as equity as sources of financing. 
So what is then the cost of capital? We agreed, we derived this mathematically, that the cost of capital, the appropriate discount rate, should be the WACC, the weighted average cost of capital. So that is what we do here. This is the WACC. What does it mean? Well, it is called weighted average cost of capital. So it's not simply an average. What's the cost of equity? What's the cost of debt divided by two? That would just be an average. But if, you, if your firm has not exactly 50% debt and 50% equity, a normal average will be incorrect. So that's why we need to calculate the weights. The weight is a percentage. This here is a percentage. And this here is a percentage. It's not an interest rate. It's not a discount rate. It is really the percentage that tells us this firm has this percentage of equity in its capital structure. This firm has this percentage of debt in its capital structure. A simple check, should that be an exam calculation something, before you go crazy, I would immediately spend two seconds on adding up my two weights. If they don't add up to 100, something has already gone wrong. Okay, they need to add, the weights need to add up to 100. Brief side note, uh, Celine also has in the workshop one question, it's a brutal question that we consider nightmare difficulty level with I think four sources of financing. This is a simple case, this is very school-like. The company uses either equity or debt. Yeah, sure, in the real world that could be more complex. A company could have different sources of capital. They could have, for example, um, normal equity, ordinary shares, they could have preferred shares, they could have uh, two different kinds of bonds, but then you would have four different weights and not just two. Okay, So, so, so don't, don't be a slave to this formula. However many different sources of financing you have, that will be the number of different weights you have. And we said, okay, what is the weighted average cost of capital really? However much equity I use, multiplied with the cost of equity, plus however much debt I use, multiplied with the cost of debt. But then we very quickly discovered that debt is very different from equity because when we borrow money, we have to pay interest. From our perspective, interest expenses. From the perspective of the banks or the bondholders, interest income. That is not great for us, but there is something nice about it, which is Interest expenses, from our perspective, are tax deductible, meaning I'm allowed to deduct my interest expense before I calculate my tax payment. So that means by using debt finance, I will eventually end up paying a lower amount of taxes. And that is something I can factor in mathematically very easily. I simply multiply here with the bracketed term 1 minus TC. I have a, a brief side observation for you here. The whole green term, this here, RB alone would be the pre-tax cost of debt. If I multiply with 1 minus TC, so the whole term then RB cost of debt multiplied with 1 minus the corporate tax rate, that would be referred to as the after-tax cost of debt. So if you simply play around with numbers on this term, you will see depending on the tax rate, the after-tax cost of debt is always lower than the pre-tax uh, cost of debt. So that is how you also see the tax advantage. Okay, and then we said, no, yeah, awesome. We are trying to do a net present value calculation, but we cannot really do it yet because we don't know the discount rate. Then we derived that the discount rate should be the WACC. Now fine, then we try to calculate the WACC, but we immediately run into the next problem, which is, all the parameters here, I can look up easily enough. Amount of equity, S or E, right? S for shares or stocks, E for equity, divided by B plus S. So B is short for bonds, can also be called D, like delta for debt. I can look this up in the balance sheet easily, no problem. RB, I can look up in my loan contract or in the bond contract. The corporate tax rate, I can easily look up in the, in the tax code. The one thing, the one variable, the one parameter here that is giving us problems is RS, the cost of equity, because it's not really a normal interest rate that I can simply look up. So how should I calculate RS then? That is where the cap M comes in, the capital asset pricing model. 
Again, don't be weirded out now. Yeah, RS here, RJ here. It depends what you calculate or who calculates how you call the outcome here. So if a shareholder applies this, a shareholder applying the cap M would say, I am calculating my required return. If we as a company apply the cap M, we would say we are calculating RS, our cost of equity. It's the same thing. So what does the cap M tell us then? Well, the cap M essentially helps us calculate from investors perspective, a required return. From our perspective as the firm, the return of the shareholders that they want is our expected cost of equity. So we're saying, what is the cost of equity really? Well, the shareholders use this to calculate their expected return and return for an investment consists of two components. It consists of compensation for time. That would be the risk-free interest rate. By definition, a risk-free interest rate does not compensate you for risk because it's risk-free. So what does it compensate you for? Time. And the whole second part, everything else, this here, is then the compensation for risk. But let's be more specific. Which kind of risk? Firm-specific risk. So in the formula here, you see the index J. So that is what we're talking about. The company we're analyzing here is clearly called company J. The required return on the investment in shares of company J should be calculated like this. So you as a shareholder want to be compensated in the form of the return on the shares of company J uh, by being compensated for the time and for the firm specific risk. Which firm? Firm J. How? Well, let's zoom in into the bracketed term. This here simply is the return of the market portfolio, which is a basket of similar stocks as to company J. So if we are looking here at the return of Apple, let's say Apple is company J here, what would be the market portfolio? What would be the market? the index as part of which Apple is traded. So that would be the NASDAQ, the technology index. So that would be simply a basket of relatively comparable stocks. So I'm asking myself the yellow term here, what is the overall return that somebody would earn if he, she or they would invest in the market? Well, they would earn the expected return on the market. So if I then take the, ex and of course the expected return on the market, compensates again for two different things, the time and the risk, but not the firm specific risk, the whole market risk then. So if I say the yellow term compensates for risk and time, and I deduct R RF, the risk free rate, so the compensation for time, the bracketed term tells me that only the compensation for risk, for the risk of the whole market portfolio. That's not firm specific just yet. So I need to do one more step. I need to multiply then the bracketed term, so the compensation for the overall risk of the market portfolio, with beta j. So beta is a risk metric. We've discussed it is a relative metric, meaning I measure the risk of my stocks relative compared to the risk of the overall market. And I can then diagnose more risky than, as risky as, less risky than. So that is, as you see on the index J, that is firm specific. That's the risk of the firm that we are analyzing. Apple, whatever. In my example, company J. So if I multiply then the compensation for risk of the whole market with the specific value of the firm specific risk, the whole second term here is firm specific risk. The risk of firm J. So logically, this is what we want to do. We want to do a net present value calculation. Mathematically, we have to come from here. First, we have to calculate our, what from our firm perspective is a cost of equity. Once we have the cost of equity, we can hop into the WACC, calculate the WACC. And once we have the WACC, we can go back to what we really want to do, which is calculate a net present value. So mathematically, you would approach from here. Okay, 
what did we, so that was left, left side of the balance sheet, left side logic. On the right side of the balance sheet, we ask ourselves, how should we finance all our assets? With debt or with equity or with some mix? And of course, because the real world is very messy and complex with a lot of market frictions and information asymmetries, we need to approach it in a, in, a, in a simpler way. We need to make all kinds of assumptions just so we can start thinking and talking about it. So we initially, I have not even put it down as you can see, we started with Modigliani Miller in a world without taxes. And we found out very quickly in a world without taxes, the value of a levered firm should equal the value of an unlevered firm. There would not, not be any difference. That is also what you see in this diagram here. Let me pick a different color. Yeah, the, so Modigliani Miller without taxes. Proposition one is the value of a levered firm equals the value of an unlevered firm. And you can see this here. This is the diagram we started with today. Firm value is a flat line, not a decrease. It's a flat line. Value levered equals value unlevered. But very quickly we dropped the assumption of no taxes because that's obviously not the case in the real world. So we then derived, also mathematically, really step by step, how does proposition one change in a world with taxes? And we ended up with this. We diagnosed, we concluded, the value of a levered firm equals as a starting point, the value of an unlevered firm, that would be this point here, but plus the present value of the tax shield. To be more specific, the present value of a perpetual tax shield. That is really mathematically showing us only under the condition that the amount of debt does not change. So if that were to hold in the real world, firm values would behave like this the more you increase your leverage, the more firm value will go up. Brief, brief side note, we were not only talking about proposition one with taxes or without taxes, we also had a proposition two. Proposition two of Modigliani Miller shows us, here that, that is without taxes, that is with taxes, it shows us what? It shows us the relationship uh, of essentially three key variables, I would say. It shows us the relationship between R0, also known as RA, the unlevered cost of equity, B, also known as D, so the amount of debt, the amount of leverage, and RS, also known as RE, the levered cost of equity. So what does this, what does this proposition to tell us in a world without taxes? It tells us as you increase B, if B goes up, what will happen? RS will go up. Okay. The same intuition also holds for Modigliani Miller Proposition 2 in the world with corporate taxes. So as you increase leverage, D, RE will react and go up as well. We have then concluded none of this is what we really observe in the real world, simply because we don't observe firms that have 100% debt in their capital structure. There are no firms where all assets are purely debt financed. But this is actually what Modigliani Miller Proposition 1 and 2 would indicate. If you are really a believer in Proposition 2 with taxes, the logical consequence would be that you try to maximize firm value by increasing equity as much as you possibly can, which means 100%. But in the real world, we don't see firms that have 100% uh, debt in their capital structure. So what's up there? Why is that? Well, we had then to diagnose that as a firm in the real world increases leverage, firm value initially will really go up, but only to a certain point, that is the peak, and then it will go down again. But why does it go down? There's something outweighing the, the, the benefits of that, what is that? Well, all the disadvantages of that, the associated costs of that. Um, here in the diagram, the difference, wait, I need a different color. Please also notice in the diagram, the distance between firm value in Modigliani Miller uh, uh, with, uh, with taxes and 
trade-off theory. Ah, God, sorry. Here, this here is the present value of financial distress costs. So we said, okay, as a firm in, in the real world, as a firm increases leverage, yeah, really firm value goes up, but only to a certain point where the advantages of debt financing are outweighed by the disadvantages of debt financing. And we discussed also a ton of these advantages and disadvantages. The classic advantage of debt financing is of course the tax shield, no question. What other advantages do we have? The more leverage we have, the, the higher our interest expenses are, the higher the interest expenses are, the lower the money left in the firm, the less money left in the firm, the lower the probability that I, the CEO, will waste it on random crap. In finance, we would say it reduces the risk of wasteful discretionary spending. Yeah? The less money is in the company, the less likely I as a CEO will waste it on, on, on anything. And last but not least, if we increase leverage, very likely there will be some serious bankers involved and they are very good at monitoring what the company is doing, which you as a shareholder cannot do as well as because you're not specialized in handing out loans. There are also disadvantages to debt financing beside the cost of financial distress. We talked about certain agency costs of debt. What are agency costs of debt? Well, category is now disadvantages of debt. We've discussed, or well, we've discussed two. The third one is for you to click through. Underinvestment, that's for you to click through. We have discussed two more. Paying out dividends, extra, extraordinary dividends, cash dividends in a firm, in, in a, in a, in, in a firm that is financially distressed already to keep money away from the bondholders to benefit the shareholders. Okay, that would be uh, uh, an agency cost of debt. And number three, focus or prioritizing high risk projects because they might benefit the shareholders more. And why do we have these market frictions to begin with? Because in a Modigliani-Miller world, maximizing firm value is the same as maximizing shareholder value. But the real world is not a Modigliani-Miller world. In the real world, based on market frictions, distress costs based on, based on agency costs of debt, maximizing firm value is not the same anymore as, or does not need to be the same anymore as maximizing shareholder values. So we zoomed in on, on three different situations where shareholder value can be maximized at the expense of somebody else. Of whom? Of the bondholders. Okay, so that needs to be factored in as well. Uh, the diagrams, the two here, are complementary. They show you how two different metrics react. So conceptually, also maybe for your, for your master thesis later on, on the x-axis, we typically plot the independent concept or the independent variable. And on the y-axis here, we plot the dependent concept or dependent variable. So we are basically saying this here is the cause, this here is the effect. So what are we seeing here? We analyze the same cause, an increase in leverage, and observe how it impacts the dependent variable, first firm value, and then cost of capital. So how does the cost of capital react to an increase in leverage? Initially, the cost will go down, the cost of capital will go down. At this point, go away. At this point, the cost of capital will be minimized. This is coincidentally the same point where firm value would be maximized. If you increase leverage more, the cost of capital will already go up again. Why? For the same reason as, as firm value would go down because of all those market imperfections. Yeah? Uh, like, like, like agency cost of debt. And then we said, okay, so how should we approach this in the real world? And we looked specifically at two things. We said first, what should a firm do? So a normative theory. We looked at the trade-off theory. The trade-off theory really tells us what we should be doing as a manager of a firm. The trade-off theory says what we should be doing is we should consider very carefully the advantages of that and the disadvantages of that and find the optimum mix. So to balance them out. That's why it's called trade-off theory. 
We even zoomed in a little bit further then, not much, but a bit, and said, well, there's more than one trade-off theory. What I've presented in, in, in more detail was the static trade-off theory. This is really what the diagram emphasizes, as if there were one sweet spot that a company aims for. This is not really what we see in the, in the, in the real world. We see a more dynamic approach. We see that companies indeed have a capital structure in mind, but they let their capital structure fluctuate, fluctuate within a certain range. And the range has to do with the business environment. That's, that's basically it. So that was the trade-off theory. And then, last but not least, we said, well, the trade-off theory is a normative theory that tells us what you should be doing. It does not necessarily make statements about what managers or firms really are doing. So it's not descriptive, it's not describing what we really see. A better theory for understanding what's really going on would be the pecking order theory. The pecking order theory is very straightforward. It says that firms, represented by management, follow a certain logical, essentially, path. A company needs capital, they need to fund beautiful assets on the left side of the balance sheet. How should they finance it? They prefer strongly to use internal funding free cash flow, retained earnings, if you will. That is very convenient because nobody needs to ask for permission. You don't need to explain. You're not dependent on how the market perceives your suggestion. The money is already available. You can readily spend it on a new project. If, however, you don't have internal funds available, what should you do then? Not, sorry, not what should you do then. It's descriptive. What are firms doing then? Well, they issue debt first. So they increase leverage. Why? I don't know how your parents are. My father used to tell me and surprisingly still tells me, you should never get a loan, save the money and buy then the house or whatever from your own money. I imagine your parents tell you similar things. That's probably true in a private environment. In a corporate environment, it's definitely wrong. So in a, in a, in a corporate environment, financing something with debt is definitely to be preferred over equity, if you can afford it, of course because of all the advantages, tax shield and so on. But there's more. There is more because we then said, we have not only dropped our Modigliani Miller assumptions, we really try to deal now with the real world. And we said, now wait a second, in the real world, not everybody is a rational benefit optimizing individual. People don't know the same things about everything. So there are severe, huge information asymmetries. So it's relevant for me as the manager of a firm to convince a bank or a potential bondholder that the project I want to undertake really has merit. That this is not just a pipe dream, but that really, if we engage in this project, this spells out a positive future for our company. But how can I say this without just saying it? I need to send a credible signal. And then we said, yeah, yeah wait a second. Increasing leverage is a credible signal because increasing leverage means, in normal language, you raise the amount of debt that you use, you borrow more. But if you borrow money, you need to pay interest expenses on that. And then we said, a manager surely does not want to lose his or her or their job. So what, what does it mean when a manager increases leverage, fully aware that this will result in very high interest expenses? It means that the manager is very confident in the quality of the project. Brief side note here, it does not mean that this really has to happen. Uh, there are plenty of people, I'm sure you, you meet people like that as well, that are really convinced that something will turn out well, but they get their facts completely wrong. So you cannot conclude that a manager that issues debt, that he or she or they really know that this will turn out well, you can only conclude that they think that, okay? Just on a side note. So. In, 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 an, in, a, in a context, in an environment that is characterized by brutal information asymmetries, raising the amount of debt, increasing leverage is a credible signal that the manager believes that the company, the project that they consider to undertake, will turn out well. And then we said equity is the last thing in the packing order. After all other avenues are exhausted, for whatever reason, as a last resort, fine, let's finance this with equity. But why? We need to address why equity comes last. And I then said, well, we're still in, an, in the real world, in an environment that's characterized by brutal information asymmetries. 
So what? Could it not be that issuing equity is also perceived as a kind of signal, as a negative signal now? And yeah, that's exactly the case. Issuing equity is perceived as a very negative signal because you as a shareholder or as a potential shareholder know that I, the manager of the firm, can control when, point in time, when our firm will issue new equity. And you can safely assume that I will issue equity only when I think that our stocks, our shares are overvalued, meaning that the price is way higher than the quality of our firm really suggests or would indicate. You know for a fact I would not issue equity when our stocks are undervalued because I would leave money on the table and I would not do this. So issuing equity is really perceived as a negative signal, not just in our abstract finance uh, fantasy world with all kinds of assumptions. It really is the case. And there is evidence for that, very strong evidence. Like I said, please look up. This is for your personal, you know, finest pleasure, if you will. Look up the term announcement effect. So as a company announces, not is doing it, just announces in a press conference, yes, we will issue new equity, the share price on average drops pretty much the very second that this news is released by about 5%. So how do firms deal with this in the real world? Or managers, I should say. They allow for accumulation of a bunch of good news, which each positive news item drives up the stock price a bit more, a bit more, a bit more. And then I drop the bomb. Oh, by the way, there will be a small equity issue. Ooh. So that the 5% on average decrease in stock price price is not too perceived as too painful for the shareholders. And this releasing good news bit by bit to build up the stock price before you drop the, the equity bomb, the term for that would be stock price run up. Okay. Uh, did I forget something? Question? Yeah, of course. One question. Of course, please. It is really, yeah, it's a good question. That's really going back to the lemons market. You as a potential investor don't really know. I mean, you know why I want to, why I want capital, why I as the manager am asking for more capital because I have to explain this. I will say, hey guys, we need to raise more capital, debt or equity because we are dominating all markets, only we are not a big player in, let's say, Asia yet. So I want to raise capital that we can also conquer, let's say, the Asian market. So that's the, the, the reason that I certainly explain why we need more capital. You know that if it's really a cool project, I would issue, of course, debt, right? Because debt, raising debt is a positive signal. So just the fact that I don't issue debt, but equity already would be a warning sign for you. Because you know, now, wait a second, if he finances the conquering of the Asian market with that, the firm would enjoy the tax, uh, the tax benefits of, 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 the, of the tax shield. He's clearly not doing this. If the project is as good as he says, if he really is able to conquer the Asian market, then debt financing would be more logical. But he deliberately says he wants to finance it with equity. So that would be the first warning flag, the first warning sign. And then you would think some more. You would say, now wait a second, he's the manager of the firm. That means he can decide when to issue new equity. I'm not talking about an IPO. I'm talking about a corporation whose equity already is traded. So that means there is already a stock price. Let's say the stock price is 100. The current stock price of our stocks in circulation. And what I'm saying is let's issue some more stocks at the current market price to raise the money that the firm needs to conquer the Asian market. To stick with my example. You know that I would not issue equity, I as the manager, at a point in time where I think the 100, the current stock price, is too low. So if I as the manager think that the real value of our stock should be 120 per stock, I would never issue a single stock at only 100 because I would leave the difference of 20 in my example on the table. So when would I issue then stock in terms of timing? That happens frequently that a stock that has a fundamental value of let's say 100 but is traded for 150. So meaning it's really overpriced. You should not buy this 
because the price is way higher than the quality of the stock would merit. So when do you see me as a manager issue new stocks or shares? Just based on logic without talking to me, you must know that I will never issue shares when they are undervalued because I don't leave money on the table. However, I have a great interest in selling a stock for 150 whose real value, real as in fundamental value, is only 100 because I get them almost 50 euro for free on top of. So the timing is what would concern you. You know I only issue stocks when they are overvalued and that's exactly what you as a shareholder want to avoid. Okay, does this make sense? Yes, thank you. Awesome, super. Yeah, I have also on the slides worked out, by the way, an example really in the stock price context. It's a thought experiment. If you understand about why equi um, issuing equity is a negative signal, like I just explained it, I'm really perfectly fine with this. But I have on the slides, I think it's two slides or three slides, a thought experiment. The true value of a stock is unknown. It could really be this, this or this. And then playing out the different options, this very game theory related. So if you're very much into finance, go through the slides. I mean, you should go anyway through the slides, but go through the slides. And especially if you love playing poker, if you like playing Texas Hold'em occasionally, and you like this thinking, what do I have? What does my opponent have? What does my opponent think I have? What does my opponent think I think that he or she has? So if you like these kind of brain jerk offs, check it out, okay? That's really a bit of, on top of. That's, that's basically it, guys. That is what we have discussed so far. Is there anything that, that strikes you as, as, as challenging, as worthy of more explanation, as in need of more explanation? Or is this, is this clear, guys? Yeah, super nice. All right, I'm very happy. Then I would suggest we end, as I've promised, I've prepared a couple of, of questions. I, I just sat down and thought, yeah, a little bit of basically what we have discussed bit of a mix. Uh, yeah, let's just do it. I need to, I don't know why I've plugged everything in, I think. Let me see. Oops. Save. Okay. Uh, PC. Boop. Okay. Give me a second. I just need to wake up my laptop again. Okay, like I said, this is just in no particular order. I just really sat down and brainstormed and tried to cook up some, some stuff. Let's have a look. It's, it's not a menti because on menti it would be purely multiple choice. I, I sometimes like it also if you provide a bit more. Just type your answer in the chat um, that, I, that I can have a brief look and we, we, we can zoom in and elaborate if something needs elaborating on. Let me just... I also want to see the YouTube chat. Give me a sec. Da is the super. Okay, let's, let's get ready. Question number one. Topic would be WACC and hurdle rate. Which statement is correct? WACC and hurdle rate are completely unrelated. The WACC is the hurdle rate or if the internal rate of return of a potential project is less than the WACC, the firm will decide to do the project. This is full disclosure. This is actually first year content. Still, because we talk so much about WACC, I think it's valid. Brief, brief background information. I like a question like this because when you know finance, this, I mean, this is so easy, it's boring. If you have no idea, very difficult, I think. Let me see what's happening in the chat. Okay, let me see here. A, C, B, okay, B. I see a wild mix of responses. I mean, it's not your actual exam. On the exam, I will not ask you multiple choice. I will ask you, of course, where you have to answer in full sentences, present a bit of an argument. What, 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 what is it? Let's, let's talk about it. So the, the correct answer would be B, the WACC is in fact the hurdle rate. So the WACC is your cost, your weighted average cost of capital. 
So that is how much financing whatever costs you. We, we would use it as a hurdle rate in the context of internal rate of return calculations. So you would look at a project and ask yourself, should I do the project, yes or no? You could calculate then the internal rate of return. That is basically telling you about the merits, the benefits of doing this project. It will be a return, it will be a percentage. If the internal rate of return is then higher than the WACC, so in simple language, in simple human language, internal rate of return is telling you in percent what engaging in the project will give you. And the WACC is a percentage that tells you how much it will cost you. So if the internal rate of return is larger than the WACC, you would engage in the project. And as such, the WACC is the hurdle rate. If IRR is more than the WACC, you would say it earns more than the hurdle rate. Boom, you would do it. Okay? Any questions about this? Can't be. It's first year content. You're pretty good at this. Let's look at the cap M. This is a question that I would not classify as easy. I would classify this as very easy. The cap M, this is the cap M. I didn't use the formula editor because just wanted to come up with something quick. R of a company equals RF plus RM minus, ui, that should be RF, sorry, that's my typo here. That should be an RF scandal. What does the, the term RM minus RF represent? Is it the return of the market portfolio? Is it the market risk premium? Or is it the compensation for time, but not for risk? Type in the chat. Let me see. B, 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 B. Nice. Yeah, absolutely correct. Just a brief recap. I mean, we already did. RF, I would interpret is the risk free rate. It's of course the compensation for only time, but no risk. The bracketed term, RM first tells us the return on the market portfolio, which itself compensates for time and risk of the market. But if I then deduct RF from it, I get here the compensation for only the risk of the market. So the whole bracketed term is referred to as market risk premium. Okay. Sometimes I saw this in the past on an exam, we gave a cap M exercise, cap M question. And we wanted basically that students can focus on the essentials and not lose time based on stuff that we know they can do. So we did not say we want that you calculate RJ and we give you the risk free rate, the return on the market and the risk free rate. We simply said the risk free rate is whatever 5% and the market risk premium is 2%. And then we, we wanted to basically have an easy question on the exam. And then when we graded, we saw that I think something like a third of the students got it wrong. Not just wrong, they could not do it. And after the exam, they said, we think there was a mistake in the exam. You asked us to calculate this, but you did not give us RM separately. So they could not calculate the bracketed term, they felt. But the, we gave them the whole number already. Okay, So market risk premium is the whole bracketed term. No need to calculate anything here anymore. Okay, nice. Net present value. Let's look at this. This is really where you need to type in also please in the chat maybe one or two keywords uh, that, that I have a bit of context. Will a company always engage in projects that have a positive net present value? Yes, of course. No, because a positive net present value represents a decrease in firm value and thus would harm shareholders. Or no, because some other explanation, like I said, if you think C, type in one or two keywords that we can theoretically talk about it. Let me see. Let me have a look at the chat. A. Not if it's mutually exclusive with a higher MPV. I always have to wait a couple of seconds for, for YouTube also. C, they might not have the budget. A, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, 
A little bit of a diverse mix. Let me see. No, another project might have a higher net present value. Okay. So first of all, I'm not talking to, to you now as a finance person. I'm really talking to you as a teacher. Side note. Questions that use the word always or never, you should immediately be careful. I cannot think of any scenario that always or never applies because then there, there are always crazy exceptions. So if I'm a student doing this exam, I would be highly skeptical of A simply because always would freak me out. I want to give you more of an, uh, an explanation than simply exam creation logic. Why is A not correct? Let me describe to you a positive net present value opportunity that I hope you would not undertake. Imagine uh, you are running a company and what the company is doing, it produces filters for basically industrial chimneys. And what the filters that you do, uh, that you produce, what they do is they filter out CO2. A net present, a positive net, highly positive net present value opportunity would be for you to bribe the Dutch government to take climate change more seriously, to basically pass a law that says something like, until tomorrow, all firms need to cut their CO2 emissions to zero. Because, huh, as it just so happens, your company produces CO2 filters. So bribing the Dutch government in the way I just described would have an insanely highly positive net present value for you. But would you do it? Hopefully the answer is of course not because that's illegal. All right. So just because something might be monetarily beneficial does not mean we do it. Even most finance people have enough of a personal ethics to not engage in this. Okay. Also, I saw that was the example I thought about when I pre prepared the question. I have to admit that your answers are much better. Uh, the, the correct answer would be no, because you said, well, the projects could be mutually exclusive. Why would projects be mutually exclusive in the real world? No, because you're constrained. You don't have enough capital to do every single uh, positive net present value opportunity. That's also not the idea. So you said correctly, you would focus on the one with the highest positive net present value, assuming it's not illegal or highly unethical. Okay. And of course, B is complete nonsense. Let's have a look at Modigliani Miller with taxes. Assuming Modigliani and Miller proposition one and two hold in the real world, which capital structures would we observe? Debt to equity ratios between 20 and 80%, but never more and never less. Or we would only observe all equity firms, or we would only observe firms that are fully debt financed. Let me see. Okay, I see mostly I see mostly C's, the occasional B. Well, Modigliani Miller, proposition one and two with taxes. So if that were to hold in the real world. It means that as you increase leverage, you get to enjoy the tax benefit, the tax shield. So you would want to maximize firm value, of course. How would you do it? By maximizing the tax shield. How can you maximize the tax shield? By maximizing the amount of debt that you use in your capital structure. So how much debt can you use as a maximum? Well, 100%. So the correct answer here would be C. We would observe only firms that are 100% debt financed simply because that would maximize firm value. Assuming Modigliani Miller proposition one and two with taxes would hold in the real world, which it doesn't. Nice, nice guys. Okay. Ah, math. Let's talk about that. This is Modigliani Miller without taxes. RS equals R0 plus B divided by S multiplied with R0 minus RB. What does R0 represent here? Boom, boom. Cost of unlevered equity, cost of levered equity, cost of debt, or the WACC. I 
I see in the chat how my cat is doing. He was the first two hours completely crazy and wanted to play in the studio here, bothering me deeply. I don't mind admitting he's sleeping downstairs now, <sighs> finally. Let me see, what do we have? A, 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 also on YouTube. Very nice, guys. Yes, that is the cost of unlevered equity. Bonus question here. Imagine I don't like writing R0. What else could I write? Which other abbreviation would also work? <laughs> nice. Nice. Good so, guys. Yeah, excellent. R, A. It's the same thing. I see a question in the YouTube chat. What's the difference between unlevered and levered equity again? Simple. Unlevered means a company that has only equity. There is no leverage whatsoever. And levered equity means the cost, or the cost of levered equity, I should say, is the cost of equity in a firm that does not only have equity, but also some degree of leverage, so some amount of debt, okay? Super guys, do I have one more? Oh, yes. Modigliani Miller with taxes. Let's have a look. RE equals RA plus D divided by E multiplied with 1 minus TC multiplied with RE minus RD. Just for refreshing. Based on Modigliani Miller with taxes, what do we find? The cost of equity rises faster than in the without taxes case when a firm increases leverage. The cost of equity rises as fast as when the firm increases leverage. The cost of equ equity rises not as fast as in the without taxes case as leverage goes up. This is a question, I still find it's of medium difficulty, but it's already approaching something where I would say it's more difficult probably, also because of the way I phrased it. Let me see. Seems a bit of a mix. Mm -hmm. Okay. A, B, A. Okay. What's happening on YouTube? I see a fair amount of A. The cost of equity rises faster than in the without taxes case when a firm increases leverage. So we are comparing two different scenarios, cases. We are comparing Modigliani Miller without taxes to Modigliani Miller with taxes. So in the case of Modigliani Miller with taxes, I mean, that's the, the whole statement that this formula represents. As you increase leverage, so as D goes up, RE will go up. But in the case in Modigliani Miller with taxes, the cost of equity rises not as fast as in the case without taxes. All right? Why is that? Why is that, guys? Because you're multiplying by 1 minus TC, which lowers the debt. Very nice, man. Absolutely correct. I mean, you said the mathematic correct explanation because of this term here. If we want to express this thought in sort of conceptual logic, well, because taxes in the Modigliani-Miller framework are, of course, beneficial to us, right? That's the, the whole tax shield conversation. So, yeah, as you increase that, the cost of equity will go up with taxes, without taxes, but in the case with taxes, it will not go up as fast as because of the tax benefit. Again, this is something that is not really rocket science. The way to basically... Do I can imagine this gives you maybe a bit more trouble than the other questions. I would suggest that you simply assume a couple of numbers and play it out. Leave everything constant and only change D. So just invent numbers, whatever, 3%, 25%, uh, I don't know, 6%, whatever you want, and change only the amount of D and see what happens here. And then do the same thing, but without the tax term and simply compare. It seems maybe like a little bit of waste of time to, to do three times this calculation, three times this calculation uh, without taxes, but then you just really see it, okay? It becomes more intuitive. This is it, guys. This is it. Let me check the time. Oof. Two o'clock, 2.15. 
guys. That is what I have prepared for today. I, I don't have more. I mean, I'm happy, of course, to answer questions, should there be questions. But I feel, I mean, three hours and 12 minutes of finance in the morning is uh, certainly enough for my taste. If we stop lecture now, I would not feel like a lazy bum. Um, if you have questions, if there's anything I need to do, can do, can explain for you, by all means, unmute yourself, shout at me or, or, or send it in the chat. But this is as much as I have prepared. Thank you. You're most welcome, guys. Any questions? Thank you. You're pissing out. Okay. Thank you. Guys, have a great day. Go to the workshop Friday. And I see you next week in usual awesomeness.